the 16th meeting of this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee and remind everybody to switch off their electronic gear apart from uh, tablets and things which people increasingly use but uh, phones can interfere with the sound system. So agenda item one today is the Land Reform <coughs> Review Group um, and I apologise before we start that. We have um, apologies from Cara Hilton and uh, her substitute is Claire Baker. Welcome to the committee. Um, sorry, agenda item one, land reform review group, final report, and welcome uh, to the committee this morning, uh, the panel, Dr. Alison Elliott, John Watt, Ian Cook, and Pip Tabor. And uh, we ask Alison if she wishes to give us an introduction just now, uh, before we come to questions, which can be wide and various, I suspect. <laughs> welcome. Thank you very much, convener. Um, I should I introduce everyone first of all? Um, I think if you want to say what they do, yeah, we kind of see their names. So, we, but please Indeed. feel free. John, do you want to say who you are? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, John Watt. Do I, do I use, use you, you do. Uh, I'm John Watt. I um, a, I've been involved in um, land ownership issues mainly around community land ownership for the last many, many years. I, I was working with Highlands and Islands Enterprise for several deca decades, um, uh, laterally with community land ownership. Uh, I currently uh, chair the Scottish Land Fund Committee. Good morning. I'm Ian Cook. I'm the director of the Development Trust Association in Scotland. So we're a national organisation <coughs> for community-led regeneration agencies. So that covers both rural and urban communities. My background has largely been regeneration, but particularly in urban areas. Um, over the years, and often from a sort of community dimension. Uh, good morning. My name is Pip Tabor. I manage a small rural development charity called the Southern Uplands Partnership, which covers southern Scotland, Dumfries and Galloway borders, south and east Ayrshire, and sometimes south Lanarkshire, depending on what's going on there. My background is actually in ecology and uh, natural resource management. Yes, I'm Alison Elliott, and I'm former moderator of the Kirk and also former. Uh, convener of SCVO. Uh, I think we have produced a report which is serious, uh, is substantial and is comprehensive. Uh, but I think that going through it, there is a, a, a position which is quite clear. We take the line that um, land is a finite resource and it is a crucial resource for the whole of the country. Uh, and therefore decisions about how it's used and how it's owned should be taken in the public interest and for the common good. And so that's a straightforward democratic principle which I think underlies what we're saying. Um, it's a simple principle but it has several consequences, in fact 62 of them. And uh, we look forward to exploring them with you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to ask you a general question to start off with about your work patterns because the difference between the uh, interim report and the personnel change and your new activities which have led to the final report um, obviously required a different uh, way of going about these things because you've expanded the areas you're looking at. But can you tell us a bit more about your interaction with stakeholders and uh, a bit about why you chose to work this way? Yes, uh, well, I mean, the original plan was that in the first phase we would be out and open and uh, trying to find out what was going on on the ground, and that is what we did. So there was a lot of engagement with people right across the country uh, and in different, with different interests in land reform uh, and in land use and, and ownership across the country. Uh, it was always the intention that in the second phase we would then start to develop a, um, an overarching framework for the report and develop in a bit more detail some of the some of the topics uh, arising from that and so although there was you know it is a game of two halves as people have said uh, it was always intended in a sense that that would be the case having um, a diff different personnel it meant we had a second bite at the cherry it meant that we had uh, seven minds in the job instead of three which i think we've benefited from um, in the second phase we certainly because we were developing that framework and developing uh, proposals which were going across the, the whole 
the whole subject, and this is, we know that it's, it's a large subject. It was difficult to be to have just general open conversations with people going forward, but it doesn't mean that we didn't uh, consult people. We certainly went with targeted questions to to various sources, uh, and uh, we continued to collect evidence during phase two. But yes, our, our heads were down in phase two instead of uh, being more open. Thank you, uh, Alec Ferguson wanted to. Come in on this. Thank you. I wonder if I could just. Good morning, by the way. Morning. It's nice to see you here again. Um, I wonder if I could just follow up on that because I, I've I've had a concerns raised with me that um, the and you quite rightly state that you're not an expert committee and you've been reliant on expert advice from others. But I have had concerns raised with me that since the in in phase two, if I can put it that way, um, the the consultation that you've undertaken has not been as extensive as some people might have expected it to be. Um, is, is it possible to, I mean, you say you have consulted and, and put targeted questions to people. Can we find out as a committee who you have consulted with in phase two? Um, I, I think it, I think it would, would be possible. Um, uh, you mean just now? For, no, not just to... now, but if, you, if you're <coughs> able to let us know at some stage. Yes, I mean, um, as I say, it, it tended to be consulting individuals with, with um, mm. expert mm. Uh, information. But also, yes, you, you're quite right to raise the fact that we had um, uh, an advisory panel of experts, and uh, it, in phase two, I mean, we engaged with some of them more than with others, but they were very useful in phase two in, uh, in giving us that cut of their expertise and also pointing us toward other people to, to consult with. I, um, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I, I'm, I'm aware that one of the expert panel saw fit to resign mm -hmm. last April. I think it was. Mm -hmm. can, can you tell us why? I think it was for personal reasons. I mean, I think it's not for us to to um, to just put words into his mouth. Okay, um, thank you. Um, if it was possible to furnish us with any further details of who's been consulted with outside the expert group since you entered phase two. Mm -hmm. um, if you're able to let the committee have that, I'd, I'd be very interested in okay, that, thank if that's you. possible. Yes. Thank you. A slight follow-up on, on the technicalities of this. Um, there's 484 uh, docu documented submissions. Some of them are anonymous. Can these all be read by uh, us to see what they said? Um, I, I think when people said that they were confidential, then they were confidential, and I hadn't asked the question, I don't know. There's three categories, there's the ones that are named and open to everybody, there's uh, ones which were uh, anonymous but are still available and there are those that uh, wished uh, for the, their submissions to remain confidential. Mm -hmm. So these are available online or where? They're all online. They're all online. Uh, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I'd like to welcome the report and thank the committee for the work they've undertaken over the last few months. And there was some criticism of the interim report, but the second report is certainly encouraging and I think does lay out the wide range of issues that encompass land reform. Um, just a question about timescales. We have had a letter from the Minister that says it will in, the report will inform the debate on land reform for the coming decade. I mean, obviously, it's getting the balance right between areas where we would like to see progress and whether we can see progress in this parliament, and also recognition that they're complicated issues and we need time to consider. Have you taken any judgment on where there might be opportunities for quicker progress and where maybe there needs to be a wee bit more consideration? Well, John did a very useful um, summary for us going through the recommendations and laying them out as uh, could be done now, could be started now, could require research and so on. So. So we have we have a, a, a sort of aid memoir for our for ourselves on that one. And but yeah, is it possible to share that? Is, is, it, is it an intention to publish that or to share that with government or with the committee or with? I think as a steer John, on some of the timescales. We really just an aid memoir for ourselves. Uh, we, we believe that there are things that the government could start right away. And in fact, they've made a couple of announcements uh, even in the, in the last uh, two or three days. Um, there's, there are some things that can be started now, it might take a little bit of time to do. There's some, there's some will need legislative change, either amending existing legislation or in, in, in drafting new legislation. And there are some which we would admit we haven't got the final answers, that they will need further research and, uh, and, and, uh, and study before coming to a final conclusion. But I think there are... 
there are several things. I mean, if I was to just take a couple of examples, uh, the, the, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about the whole issue about state aid, and uh, government can give clear, clear instructions to its own departments and, and agencies almost now to, to clarify uh, how state aid might be uh, made more uh, flexible, the interpretation made more flexible to be able to assist communities to acquire, for example. Um, the... Um, I think the government could take a could, could start the process of being more proactive about transferring crofting estates to to communities. Um, uh, I think um, making a clear public policy that uh, or a policy statement that um, diversified land ownership is a, a key policy objective of this of, of the government. These things can be done actually very quickly. Uh, yes. I think that's the kind of things which we will explore as the committee takes evidence, both from here with stakeholders and with the ministers, to try and drop our views about timetables and so on. But, uh, you know, anything that you have that you see, and it's obvious from the report that there are some things that will take a lot longer, so the work streams obviously will be, have to be laid out in some detail now once we see... Uh, what, uh, what what's being said. So I think we should try and concentrate on dealing with some of the specifics uh, now that we've uh, had this sort of opening uh, bout. Um, land registration comes up, first of all, since it's already been mentioned publicly. Um, it's not the first time that I've seen the famous map that shows the very large largest estates in uh, figure four, uh, which uh, shows that, in fact, it should be possible for people to uh, register. Um, do you think that uh, the timescales that the government has set up, uh, about five years for public bodies and ten years for private bodies, is appropriate, or do you think it should be faster? I think when we were discussing it as a, as a group, we didn't have a view about exactly what the timescale should be, but that there should be a target set. Um, and we understand that that, I mean, the the commitment was there in the 2012 Act anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a case of having a, a, a target on it. Um, the practicalities of it, I understand, are, are considerable. And so five years and ten years um, seem to be okay. But if um, there was encouragement for the states to get on with the job mm -hmm. of actually making their maps, uh, they could then take their turn in the queue to get them registered if they had been done. So, in fact, there is potential, depending on how we put it, that you could get this process going now if the signals were sent out. Mm -hmm. um, did you take that into account at all? I think we, we considered various triggers for, the, for the, the registration as being something that... Uh, I mean, there are triggers already, I think, in the Act, but, but there could be further ones in terms of uh, people applying for public pu public funding and so on, um, and that these would would presumably get get the, the registration moving a bit faster. Uh, but we didn't consider further further uh, ways of, of speeding it up. Right. Okay, thanks thanks for that one. Um, we'll look at uh, owners of land next. Uh, Claire Baker wants to lead on this. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I was interested in your comments around um, registration of land and overseas registration. And in the report, um, you state that the review group consider whether there might be scope in Scots law to exclude certain types of overseas bodies from owning land in Scotland, identify it in the interest of traceability and accountability. Um, what are the, the problems you see with um, ownership that is registered outside of the EU? What difficulties does that present in terms of how Scotland's land is, is managed or is, is, is used for communities' interest? And, well, how is, I suppose what you, you link it to very strongly is the public interest. Mm -hmm. And has it been met by the public interest that, that it's difficult to trace? And um, what are the problems you then see in, in the practical sense? When we get into um, in, into tracing ownership, uh, this becomes ten times more complicated, many times more complicated when you look at the urban situation uh, than in the, the rural situation. Um, and so you can, can imagine that there are places where there is uh, derelict land in urban, uh, urban contexts. And if you don't know who owns it, then your capacity to do something about it is considerably lessened. Um, Ian was the person who's got most... 
understanding of the urban situation. But I think that being so, I mean, the lack of lack of knowing who the owner is uh, makes it, and lack of ability to trace who the owner is and get in touch with them, mm. uh, just slows down the process considerably. Um, and the the belief is that if 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 you have uh, um, ownership concentrated in the EU, there is already a process in place in the EU, or there's a process starting in the EU of trying to get traceability improved, and so so that we would you know be able to get jump on the back of that one really. Uh, and so, if, and where would there be? Because you refer to urban land, would it tend to be urban land, or would it tend to be more rural? Where would where where is the instances of overseas ownership highest? Is there a pattern there, and why would why would people choose overseas? What's the advantage for the owner in choosing overseas? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I don't. Yeah. In terms of, do you want to expand that question? I'm not quite sure what you're well, asking. If I ask first of all, what yeah. would be the advantages of having an EU? What I'm interested in is what is the advantage for the land owner for being registered outside the EU? Um, is it to do with tax, or is it? Yeah, yeah, it can be a range of reasons, really. Um, and I think that's an area that particularly the Scottish Affairs Committee is going to be looking at in terms of the whole question of, of taxation, etc., and how that impacts on that. Um, but I think, as Alison said, I mean, I think we've come at it from a point of, you know, a modern economy requires clear information about who owns land so that you have the ability to recycle land, to regenerate, uh, but also to, to have more influence over what happens on land in the public interest, really. Mm -hmm. So we just see that as being a sort of key part of the jigsaw that's got mm -hmm. to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And I think just finally, when we looked at the land registration um, bill a couple of years ago, there was amendments from Rhoda Grant around beneficial ownership, um, which didn't get through at that point. The solution that you come to, I think, was both trying to address the same problem. Mm -hmm. um, why did you come to the solution that you've come to about Having a bar on registering, out, having a bar on registering outside um, the EU, why was that the preferred option for this? And does it present? Sorry, it's quite a complicated area, but does it present any issues around ECHR? It's another area that I wanted the committee to to look I at. I think I think we checked that out. That it didn't. That, that, that there was um, that within the EU, it was. I mean, you there, there were certain things that you couldn't. I mean, you had to take the EU as being the uh, as being the basic scope and, and framework for any of this, uh, for, for any capacity to to limit the ownership. Um, but that within that, we thought that what was being proposed was 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 adequate and would would pass the, the test. Yeah, I mean, I think we were quite keen, keen to limit. You know, obviously, there's a whole range of offshore ownership arrangements that we were quite keen to try and address. And I think the, the proposal is, is a reflection of what we thought was a kind of practical proposal to move forward uh, and give us a bit more uh, sort, of, uh, sort of sense of who owns what and, and a bit more kind of accountability and traceability, as, you, as you've asked. It just seemed to us to be the best way to do it and the most kind of, um, sort of logical way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, supplementaries on this at the moment. Because it's obviously very interesting to people. So it may be that it answers some more of the questions that Claire started on. Dave Thompson, Jim Hume, Alec Ferguson, Angus MacDonald. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning to yourselves. Um, just to follow on, um, I mean, this is obviously a hugely complex issue and it's not going to be solved overnight. Um, and the government have said that they want the the register complete within 10 years, the public part of it within five. Did you um, get any evidence of what it might cost to do it more quickly, what the, the constraints are in terms of registrars in Scotland and so on, and, and how we could overcome that? Because it strikes me, until we get the register sorted, I mean, that's the foundation of the whole thing, and until you get that sorted, we're not going to be able to move on quite a number of the other things. And ten years is quite a long time. Um, so just to get your views on whether government should prioritise reducing that time scale, and if so, what would the cost be, do you think, or would it even be possible to get the, 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 the staff with the right qualifications and so on at, within Registrar Scotland if there was a big surge in this to do it maybe in five years or something like that? We have had uh, in, an indication of, of what it was going to cost 
to um, without the target and therefore without reducing it. Um, and so obviously it would cost more if you were going to have to do it, do it more quickly. So the, the costs would increase, certainly. Um, but exactly what that would be, I, I, I wouldn't be able to say. No. I do think that it's that it's crucial. Um, it's really and, it's crucial, I think. Yeah, and yeah. We, we would like to see the government making it making mm, it a priority, mm. certainly. To Maybe get I this could done. just put it to you in a slightly different way. Then, mm -hmm. in principle, you would want it done as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, the government have come out and said ten years, five years for the public. Um, do you think that that is adequate, or would you prefer them to try to speed that up? I think, obviously, we would like them to speed it up. I mean, we'd like to know tomorrow <laughs> who in Scotland, and if we could do that, that would be great. Uh, the, the question of, of uh, the priorities, uh, of, of uh, there, there are a whole lot of other um, uh, opportunities here for the government to spend money, um, and exactly how they prioritise that, I think, is, is, uh, is something which would take, place, take its place in... Uh, in, in a national land policy. I mean, that's one of our other recommendations, that we, we have some kind of overarching picture uh, of what is going on. People have been complimentary about the report in that we pull together a whole lot of stuff about land reform, which has been in different, mm. different areas, and people didn't necessarily see the connections um, previously. Uh, and so the importance of having an overarching picture of what the government is trying to do is is, is crucial, but I think you probably have to have that idea first of all before you prioritise the costing of it. Uh -huh. Can I maybe just have one final uh, go there, uh, convener? Um, you're recommending you know, a couple of, of, of uh, organisations be created. Uh, that will obviously take time as well, and those organisations will take a little time to bed in. Mm -hmm. So um, do you see the registration and the development of, of, of those organisations running in, in, in parallel so that something between five and ten years would actually be reasonable in that respect because it's going to take a bit of time because this is an issue that probably should have been dealt with 50 or 100 years ago. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we are where we are, we're tackling it now and I think your report is, is a, a fantastic report. There's an awful lot in there. Um, not sure I agree with everything in it, obviously, but you, you, you've given us a lot of stuff to get our, our teeth into. Uh, Can I give an example? For example, one of the, the recommendations we have is that the government should consider land value taxation. And if you're going to do that, then you need to know who owns the land. So there are some proposals in there which are going to be dependent on, uh, on, on the register being complete. On the other hand, they are also going to take time to, to, to be uh, assessed and to, to be properly uh, given an economic model and so on and researched in that way. So yes, I mean, the, the registration will be the sooner the better, but there are other things which are also going to be, need to be developed, uh, which were then going to benefit from the registration being complete. And so, uh, yeah, uh, it, it, these, th these things will be going on uh, in parallel, I imagine, for some time. Uh, and it may be that there's pressure comes from these other kinds of uh, goals of the government, uh, which would put ec extra pressure on registers of Scotland to speed up the process. Keep these to slightly shorter questions <laughs> and supplementary. Jim Hume. I hope you will. And, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, you know, just regarding the ownership of land, I mean, it clearly states uh, in your recommendations that the Scottish Government should make it incompetent for any legal entity not registered in a member state of the European Union to register title to land in the re Land Register of Scotland. And you mentioned already, Dr Elliott, that that was to help traceability and accountability. I'm not sure why they would really uh, help uh, traceability and accountability just because someone's out with the EU. I would just like to clarify that when you say any legal entity, of course, that means individuals also, uh, like clarification on that. And I'm just wondering, I mean, we already have ownership by Americans, uh, all, all sort of people in Scotland uh, regarding, land uh, regarding land ownership. What would happen with their land? Would it be taken off them because uh, obviously if they're uh, not a, a European legal entity then that that's what that statement really means to me. Uh, so a few clarifications on that would be, those points would be useful. I think we were thinking of this as being uh, registration 
oh, of new land, new registrations, uh, that they would come under that uh, under that rule. You're saying new registrations, but there's already probably a uh, land owned by people who are non-Europeans, because mm -hmm. this is obviously against anybody that's European. That may not be registered, but they may actually already be owned. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that, yeah, the, I mean, the, the purpose of this was really looking at, at companies and, and corporations. But it says any than, legal entity, yes, I, I, that's I, an individual I recognise well. that, yes, yeah. Um, but we didn't consider the, the question of, of, of new people from outside the EU um, owning the land in Scotland, and I don't think we were considering that as being something we wanted to prohibit. Well, I mean, it clearly states it. No, it I can clearly see that. states yeah, yeah. the Scottish government should make it incompetent for any legal entity, any legal entity not registered in a member state of the European Union, any non-European, to register title to land in the land of register of Scotland. That's quite clear. I can see that it's quite clear, and and I take the point. Ian, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, mean, I just thought. I mean, we took the view that. I mean, <laughs> You've got to draw the line somewhere to create some sort of... If you, if you want to improve traceability and accountability, you've got to draw the line somewhere. There'd be no problem for an American, for instance, to set up a company within the sort of EU to, to acquire land in Scotland, therefore. So we didn't see that as being prohibitive, that, but it would, it would increase the accountability and the traceability as part of the process. Right. And, and, and I mean, how far do we boil this down to? I mean, is, is this even, even building plots or, or anything like that? And... In a reaction to that from other countries, do you think it would be fair that someone from Scotland would be unable to buy land, basically, in, in other parts of non-Europe in the world? I think, yeah. I think it, would cover, it would certainly cover building blocks, wouldn't it? Well, I mean, it, it wasn't our remit to, 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 to say anything about owning land elsewhere. Um, a, but in a way like this, then other countries can react backwards. That's what I was trying to say through the two. Well, that's, well, that's potentially one of the implications, but I think that yeah, because we were driven by um, a desire for greater accountability, greater openness, identifying beneficiaries uh, as to who owns the land in Scotland, um, we reckon that registering a company in, in the, under European uh, designation was, was uh, one way of restricting that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, Alec Ferguson. Uh, I think I can save you some time, convener, because Good. that my uh, similar to my question. Okay, thank you, Angus McDonald. Yeah, um, thanks, convener, and uh, good morning. Um, can I um, just briefly follow up on um, land registration restricted to entities within the EU? Um, if I recall correctly, uh, Parliament passed a land registration bill, I think, in early 2012. Uh, and at that time, the Scottish Government rejected uh, the idea of uh, disallowing any entity outside the EU register, registering land. So I'm glad to see it back on the agenda. Um, have you looked at the situation uh, in other nor Northern European countries uh, with regard to their stance on land registration as part of your uh, deliberations? other uh, sort of European countries and obviously the pattern is quite sort of mixed and certainly some Scandinavian countries you've got to be a national to own land so I mean the pattern across Europe is quite mixed here and I think that we're in a situation where if we want a land reform programme we've got to come to a view about how we move that forward so that was the kind of view we came to as, as a recommendation. We did, we did have uh, research papers which were looking at uh, a lot of these aspects across different European countries. Mm. Okay, right, thanks. Uh, the way in which arrangements are made when Denmark joined the European Union. There's derogations to stop Germans buying holiday homes on the west coast of Denmark. So restrictions on who can own land is something that's quite common yes. in the European Union at the moment. Yes. You've found that out, I guess. Yeah. So therefore, the idea that Guernsey and Cayman Islands are not in the European Union is one of the things that you were thinking about. Ah, that's good. Thank you. I think we go on to Claudia Beamish. Next. Uh, convener, would you like me to ask? Um, he writes first. Is it? Oh, we got that wrong order. Right, no, I don't it's think just, you got it wrong. It's just. No, <laughs> I, right. I, I was going to Graham ask Day about is going to ask about Crown property rights, <laughs> and then you're going to go on to. Are you Come in. Uh, okay. Why have we got so that queer duck, convener? Thank you. Good morning. Yeah. Um, 
Crown property rights. Your report suggests that ending the Crown Estate Commissioner's involvement in Scotland would deliver wide-ranging and important benefits to Scotland. You also say there should be further significant reductions in types of Crown property rights in Scotland. I wonder if you can expand upon that and illustrate exactly what you mean by this. The first bit about the uh, ending the Crown uh, Estate Commissioner's involvement, uh, this is looking particularly at uh, the situation in coastal communities and uh, the, uh, the, the, the bringing, bringing into a, a, a Scottish context uh, a lot of the decisions that are made about the management of the, of, of the Crown Estate. Um, and it, it, this is a, a recommendation that has been made by many committees that have looked at this, so it's not a new new suggestion, this. And the, the suggestion is that it should be devolved and then redevolved, in fact, to, generally to local authorities. There's a, we don't see this in the in the recommendation, but that, there is that view around as well, that it, it's something which can be devolved right down to the local authorities. Um, the question of the other Crown um, uh, property rights in Scotland, I mean, these are... These, tend to be very uh, archaic things about uh, uh, mussels and oysters and uh, and whales and, and and things like that i mean which have and, and in a lot of this uh, some of our recommendations are are really tidying up um, the the relics of the feudal system in, which are still around um, and it takes a, a clear mind i think to to spot them but uh, I, th I think we we've, we've spotted some of these so that's that's the main thrust of that that recommendation but, but in terms of, and you're right, a number of, of people have suggested this being done uh, before yourselves, but what, from the evidence that you've taken, what are the wide-ranging and important benefits to Scotland? Can you give us some examples of where you think this would be a why you think this would be a really good thing to do? Um, Ian, do you want to pick that one up? Um, I, mean, I suppose that if you're looking uh, forward again um, and we're looking at opportunities, the whole marine environment is particularly important to Scotland, I think, going forward. And we're quite conscious that um, you know, it just seems to us that it makes sense that if the Scottish government or whatever is investing in, for instance, technologies, then, then having some sort of democratic control or accountability over that process is really quite fundamental. Thank you. That's useful. OK. Um, we want to move on to uh, local community land rights now. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, yeah, I was interested in the community land ownership uh, proposals that you bring forward. And I think there is a recognition that we want to extend opportunities for communities to own land. And at the moment, the system of in place is maybe too slow and is dependent on a willing seller being in place. Um, now, there's been different ideas around how you resolve that. And you know there's a proposal that you extend um, crofters' rights to communities has been one way to do that. Um, you seem to have decided on a compulsory purchase order um, method of making it easier for communities to have access to land. Um, why did you choose this particular model? Because as the report recognises, it's a model that isn't well used at the moment, mainly because it's seen as quite cumbersome and quite difficult. Local authorities seem reluctant to go down that road. Um, so why have you chosen this one as a solution to the issue that everybody's trying to address? I think this goes over to... Well, I mean, th th this is an example where um, several of our recommendations fit together. They're, they're not sort of standalone um, recommendations. Uh, we, we suggested a menu of community rights. We're not looking exclusively at compulsory purchase. Uh, there's, a, there's a range of community rights, which communities, some of which communities have already through part two of the, uh, the Land Reform Act, as it currently is. Um, we also, uh, as, as you know, have suggested the creation of a community land agency um, whose role would be to, uh, to uh, facilitate um, um, or mediate in, in discussions between landowners and communities, which would um, avoid the necessity of, of uh, using legislation at all, uh, because uh, there may be an unwilling uh, seller and an, ex an enthusiastic community, but uh, they may be able to be brought together rather than have meeting court, as it were, uh, uh, through through um, through u using legislation. So uh, we 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 thought that uh, there was a range of 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 rights that communities uh, could have, um, uh, but one of the ones that we have suggested uh, is in those extreme situations uh, where there's an impasse and there is no 
willing seller and there is a community um, a desperate to acquire land for specific purposes, then uh, there would be a, a right to buy, uh, as as would be in the part and part three of the Act applied to communities, in the public interest, and this would be would would have to be uh, submitted to ministers for approval. So, as I say, the, we didn't we didn't come right down on on, on compulsory purchase. Uh, it was only one of a range of of uh, ways in which communities could uh, acquire land and continue to acquire land. Um, uh, and in, in many ways uh, better than the, the situation we've got at the moment, because most of the community acquisitions that have, that have uh, come in the last 10 years have, have not been through the legislation. They've been through negotiated purchases and sales, uh, sometimes with uh, mediation and sometimes just with uh, the two parties sitting down and working out. And, uh, and we think that's, that's probably the best uh, solution, um, but there will be extreme situations in which uh, communities ought to be given a stronger right uh, if that is in the public interest. Uh, the, comment on the, the, um, the, the, the question of compulsion, there, there are various points where we're talking about a compulsory sale order, compulsory purchase order and so on, and one of the most interesting things I think about this whole process from my point of view has been realising that uh, if you have a strong framework in place for the you know, for, for when things break down completely, then actually that, nego that facilitates negotiation and it's very seldom needing to be used. We had a very interesting conversation with uh, the director of planning from one of the big cities in Scotland. And he, when he came into, pl into uh, post initially, uh, you know, used his compulsory purchase orders uh, clearly and people knew that he was prepared to use them. And and in the years afterwards has very seldom had to use it because people recognise that this is, you know, the, the, that, is, that is available as a, as a backstop. Um, one hopes it doesn't have to be used. And so the compulsory purchase, as far as the menu of rights co is concerned, is right at the very end. I mean, we're not suggesting that that should be... We're hoping that that should not be used very, very often. And it would, there would have to be a very, very strong case um, for it to, be, to, to win out because it would have to be in the public interest. That, that's helpful. I mean, it's a very detailed report that we received on Friday, sure. so the clarification on some of those issues is helpful. When it comes to definition of public interest, at the start of the report, you, you give the Park Estate example. Um, are you... Because that's often a, something that comes up. How do you define the public interest? Do, do you want to say a little bit about that? And, and maybe also link that to... You discuss um, ECHR and what that means. Do you have a... Um, I mean, you talk about the Human Rights Commission, the, Scottish, the recent work that they've done. I mean, are you, are you confident about the ECHR position? Do you think is that more work needs to be done around that? And do you think there's any role for the Scottish Government in helping to provide some clarity around how ECHR relates to land reform issues? I think as far as public interest is concerned, yeah, there are lots of ways of approaching it. The, the way we have approached it is believing that um, the guardian of the public interest uh, is the elected member and particularly the minister. And so the, the public interest, therefore, is, is uh, embedded in what the, what, what the understanding of the elected representatives is at the time. Um, and so in practical terms, that's what it boils down to. It boils down to this being um, a decision which he would make uh, or she, indeed, uh, in, uh, preferably, again, uh, you know, in, in the context of a national land policy, but also in, in terms of what is, uh, what is the current uh, thinking of the government. So, for example, just now we have a government that is, that is keen to uh, encourage community ownership, but in, there could well be a, a government that is keen to in, encourage private ownership or, or other kinds of issues. And so the, the public interest is something which is variable in that kind of way, uh, whereas the common good, we think, as being something that is a, a goal um, that is beyond uh, an identification. You know, it's, it's, it's something that... Uh, something that that the public interest serves, uh, whatever uh, the, the, the flavour of the, of the current administration. As far as ECHR is concerned, we have had conversations with Alan Miller and we've also had a, an advisor on the group who is an expert on, on uh, ECHR and its relationship with land reform. And so we understand that the, the move, I mean, the, 
And the, the, the Article 1, Protocol 1, which is the, uh, the, the, the point of, uh, at issue here, is one which does allow individuals the right to enjoy their property, but that the state has the right to intervene in the public interest. And so there is that, that, uh, that balance. We understand that a lot of the case law is moving in terms of taking the public interest uh, more seriously, but it's that balance which, uh, which basically... I think is is uh, um, is it's basically treating land ownership uh, as 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 good citizenship really, um, and seeing that ownership is should be something which takes account of of the of the consequences of that for the rest of the community. Thank you. Please, Nigel Don, first the and good morning, good morning. Uh, lady and gentlemen. I'd just like to pursue that because I think you've, you've neatly talked us to a position which I, I'd just like to make sure I understand. One of the things that you've talked about in the context of compulsory purchase is, is the process. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you've alluded to in the report is some of the difficulties in that. And it's not simple. It's therefore very easy for local authorities in particular to say, well, we just really won't bother because it's actually too expensive and too difficult. We've got other things to do. And it seems to me that that's something which you're suggesting we need to get round, and it's up to us as legislators to sort out the process. But I think the other thing you've just articulated is the difficulty of working out what is the public interest, what is the common good, and what is the potentially quite fickle and flip-flopping political view of that at any point in time, which could easily change in five years in this place and back again five years later. So... I guess I'm seeing the conflict in terms of public interest and common good. You're not going to be able to solve that problem for us, but I'd be interested to know if I've got that interpretation right. But I'd also be interested to know if I've got the right interpretation that you feel the whole process of common good needs, sorry, not common good, per compulsory purchase and or sale, needs to be sorted out and whether that's something you really want to leave on our plate. Ian? Yeah, I mean, I think my um, understanding is as we equipped with what you've said there and the way you've described the situation. Um, in terms of compulsory purchase, I mean, our experience uh, from looking at the evidence and speaking to various people was that um, if, if you look at over a period of time, there's been less and less use of compulsory purchase powers by local authorities and other public bodies over the last sort of, 10, 15 years. And as you suggest, that's caused by a number of reasons. I mean, we've got our overly complicated legislation that needs to be modernised so that would certainly help, and that's certainly something within the scope of the Scottish Government. But there's also been a, because of the lack of use, there's a lack of confidence, there's a lack of capacity within local authorities. So I've suggested ways that we can help rebuild that capacity through the creation of a housing corporation, um, which takes us on to the housing section. But I think within the report, and you have got to jump about a bit to see where the, the various bits fit together, um, we, we address that the, there are problems. Um, I think that the question of costs is often overused by local authorities. There are, there can be costs, etc. But if you look at local, local authorities who do and are prepared to use compulsory purchase powers, they would say that over the, the balance of projects they take on, the costs tend to even out. So again, it comes back to that lack of confidence just to go down that road in the first place, I think. And I think we've got to get back to a position where we have got the confidence within our public bodies to be able to do that. Clarification, thank you, convener, if I may. Um, originally, th there was some quite sort of controversial language used, and I think I'm right in saying that the phrase that sort of came into the domain was that you would be looking at the right of a community to buy, I think, I think I'm right in saying, even in the absence of a willing seller was the sort of phraseology that was used at the time. And I just seek clarification because I think I'm right in saying you've slightly come away from that in that you are saying that a, a compulsory purchase order should only be pursued over vacant or derelict land. Uh, am I right in, in, in my interpretation of this? Uh, I'm afraid not. Um, I, think the, the, I was rather the, afraid I might not be. We use it... We use the idea of a compulsory sale order over derelict land, um, and that's different from a compulsory purchase order. A compulsory purchase order is where the local authority uh, or, or the, the body knows what they want to do with it. Um, and the compulsory sale order is where they just want someone to do something with it. Um, and so, so in that sense, that's where the compulsory sale order comes in. The compulsory purchase order is, is where there is a purpose um, you know, for, for acquiring the land in, in the first place. And that's, so that's rather different. In that case, question, sort of yeah. hypothetical situation to you. 
uh, some, someone has a small holding on the edge of a community, and the community believes there's a public benefit in it taking over some of that land for public good, uh, um, and it might be totally laudable aims. In, in pursuing that order, the small holding uh, might be rendered com completely inoperable. Uh, do, do you envisage that being taken into account during this sort of process? Because it would surely be wrong for that to be pursued if the, the, the business that you're affecting becomes uh, unsustainable as a result of it. I, I thought that's quite clear part of the public interest. I mean, I think the situations that we come across and a number of our members uh, confront is situations in small rural communities in particular where there's a need for, in some cases, as little as two or three, half a dozen uh, houses to be built, affordable houses, and they're landlocked by one, la so they're completely landlocked in terms of one landowner who is not prepared to sell land and therefore threatens the, the future sustainability of that community. So that's the kind of situation I think we had in mind where there's you know, quite clearly in the public interest. Um, if we want to save rural communities, and particularly fragile and isolated rural communities, that we can begin to sort of shift, shift the equation a bit, really, and uh, address these particular issues. Just, um, it, it is a long report, and there's a lot of bits that fit together. Uh, and maybe just, just a couple of words of clarification. We do talk about, uh, we make a recommendation about modernising and bringing up to date the compulsory purchase uh, legislation. Uh, and that's mainly for public bodies compulsorily purchasing. In the menu of rights that we're suggesting for communities, one of the rights is we, we are recommending is the right for communities to request a compulsory purchase by a local authority. Um, and the, the, thir the third one, if you like, is we're also recommending within the menu of community rights the right of the community to acquire uh, land uh, where there is not a willing seller. But all of that is, it has to be judged to be in the public interest uh, uh, through a due process. And just to complicate it, or, or hopefully clarify it, um, the, the, the concept of the compulsory sale order uh, is, is at the moment we is restricted to vacant and derelict land uh, where we are um, encouraging um, land that has lain, lain derelict for potentially many, many years, uh, the, the, giving the power to local authorities to force that to be sold. Not to communities, not to, to be sold, and usually by auction. Mm -hmm. it, I'm sorry, just to pursue this, Convener, uh, does it have to be vacant and derelict or vacant or derelict? Vacant or derelict. Thank you. And I do apologise for not having understood that difference, like others, that we've had very little time to consider all of this. So I'm grateful Indeed. for that. You'd be glad to know I agree with half of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think the, you, your example is, is an interesting one, though, in, in pointing up the difference between a legal process where you have you know, one owner here and one community here or a, a potential buyer, uh, where you have, uh, you know, a conflicting kind of approach, whereas the public interest is something that should be wide and should consider, you know, the consequences of that decision right across, not just for the two yeah. uh, uh, participants, but also for the wider community. And we hope that the community land agency would provide space for that to be explored more effectively than, than just being done through through the courts. Thanks for the clarification. A housing issue that we can slot in here before we come into the acquisition costs in a minute. Thank you very much, Kinnear, because I've been trying to find a way to raise this particular question today. I am going to go off at a slight tangent, but please bear with me, um, because it pertains to rural housing. Uh, one of your um, recommendations is that to address housing need and the changing nature of the private rented sector, a change is required in the nature of tenancy arrangements within the sector, and you recommend the Scottish Government introduce longer and more secure tenancies in that private rented sector. I wonder what evidence you, you may have come across in relation to estate houses in that regard, because the relationship between tenants and estate owners and estate houses is quite unique. I mean, in many cases, there will be very low rent paid, maybe no rent paid, but at the same time, the occupants may have been there 20, 30 years and have invested heavily in their houses, and they have no rights at the moment. Was that something you were thinking about when you made this recommendation? Yeah, we do refer I think in one paragraph to the question of tied housing, and I think that from what we could see, it accounts for about 40% of the private rented sector in the rural parts of Scotland. Um, I mean, 
despite having a, 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 a very kind of accomplished rural advisor on the rural housing advisor on the group, there, there's a distinct lack of information around tied housing. Uh, and I suppose our greatest concern, particularly in a land reform context, was, as you've suggested, the lack of tenancy agreements that seem to exist. So you know, it's very difficult to, to know what, how secure people's tenancies actually are. And as you say, people invest in houses, etc. So that's certainly an area. We haven't made a specific recommendation, but we've flagged it up as something that needs further research. And, and it's really quite urgent, I think. Okay, that's welcome. Thank you for that. Well, um, community acquisition costs. Steve Thompson to lead on this one. Yes, convener. Um, I was particularly interested in the issue of the, the state aid, um, and to get you know maybe further views from you in terms of making you know well, government guidance, uh, as you say here, um, to ensure public bodies take a more solution-focused and less risk-averse uh, approach. And uh, I would certainly agree with you that. Um, the state aid rules appear to me um, to have been used by bodies in the past as a sort of excuse and a reason for not doing something rather than for those bodies to look at a way uh, around those. And I just wonder if you could elaborate a wee bit on that and did you have any particular examples of where this had been the case that might help us understand? Yeah, well, it's, it's one of the... Uh the, the topics that came up in our discussions with stakeholders um, a, a lot and, a lot, and, and indeed uh, characterised a lot of the evidence that we received in the early stages of this. Uh, communities uh, feeling that um, their aspirations were being um, stultified by, by what they thought was the interpretation of regulations rather than the regulations themselves. And I know that the government is, is uh, very aware of this, and I know that work is going on uh, right now in terms of clarification of interpretation of state aid regulations, which uh, I think is, is potentially extremely helpful. But there are, there are several um, communities um, that we were aware of and made, made aware of, um, especially those interested in land which involved forestry, um, a, a wishing to acquire, wishing to manage uh, forestry um, in different ways than it was currently being uh, managed, uh, who felt that they were they were they would be unable to acquire um, these these um, bits of land um, because they couldn't access public funding due to state aid rules, and the interpretation that this is a, an international market in timber. Um, that uh, any any assistance from the state has to be well within the, the limits uh, d defined by the state aid rules, um, and therefore um, uh, public bodies being reluctant to to fund on that on that basis. Um, the argument is that is the scale of the activity that these communities wish to to uh, to be involved with going to interrupt international markets. Uh, um, and that kind of judgment uh, as to whether this breaches state aid regulations or not uh, appeared to us and appeared to our stakeholders who told us about this to be erring always on the side of, of conservative and caution rather than on, uh, uh, on, on risk aware. Um, and I, I think our recommendation is, is that um, the government, without changing any of the rules, could actually uh, take a more flexible approach to this, which we are, which we feel is being taken in other parts of the UK. Can I just follow on, convener, uh, from from that? Um, it, it runs on to the to the whole issue of um, you know market value and and uh, the insistence that that um, state land, etc., forestry or whatever, has to be sold at mar market value. But there's also another related one which I would appreciate your views on, and that is that. Individual bodies like Forestry Commission or individual local authorities, especially smaller local authorities and so on, uh, we mentioned just a minute ago about, you know, their, the, the reduction in number of CPOs and so on. It strikes me that one of the reasons why this is happening is that they maybe don't have the expertise themselves in, in their own legal departments, some of them because they're sm quite small authorities, um, and therefore, if they are going to go down a particular road and there's a danger that it will be appealed and they have to hire QCs, they can get into huge expense. 
Had, have you thought at all about any kind of way round that, whether in those circumstances there should be some kind of national fund that can be tapped into to allow them so they're not frightened to tackle um, you know, what could be very wealthy uh, or individuals or organisations in relation to the CPOs? Um, and that would apply generally, you know, it would apply to local authorities, for, forestry and so on. Or, you know, would you envisage that one of the national bodies would maybe have a power to assist smaller or local authorities or the forestry or other bodies when it comes to these issues, especially when there's a matter of principle involved, so that they could come in and they would have the wherewithal to actually tackle the very powerful vested interests that they might be challenging? We certainly, um, again, just to make the point, point um, so that within the um, establishment of a housing corpor corporation, whose prime function would be to assemble land for housing development, uh, a, 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 a capacity and experience around using compulsory purchase powers. And we mentioned in the report the, the, the possibility of working alongside local authorities and begin to sort of share that. So I suppose. We haven't looked at the question of a sort of separate fund, etc., but we have looked at the question of trying to build the expertise and then look at how we can cascade that down so that we build up the um, expertise within, as you say, particular local authorities. I think when you're looking at asset transfer, I mean, part of the problem seems to me that if you're asking a local authority or a public body, particularly local authorities, what, what, should, what the cost should be, uh, the question often is that there's six answers comes from the local authority and there's different departments that have got a different view on this depending on how they're thinking about this. So again, what we're suggesting is that we need to encourage local authorities to take a much more strategic approach to this. So they've got a cross-departmental line on transferring assets at what sort of cost. Because quite often, um, by transferring it at lesser market value, you're by definition investing or achieving some other kind of aim that the council is trying to achieve. So I, I think that more strategic approach is something that we've tried to encourage within the within the report as well. I think, if I, if I may, Chair, there's just just a couple of extra points there. There, there. There's the whole issue about the transfer of publicly owned land to communities, um, which doesn't involve compulsory purchase at all. That compulsory purchase is primarily for yeah. public bodies to acquire from private owners. If we, if we look at the, dis, the, the asset transfer or disposal of public loan land to communities, um, we identified again through stakeholder discussion two things. One was the state aid issue, and the second was uh, the rules under the Scottish uh, Public Finance Manual, um, which um, gave the impression that, the, uh, that public bodies are unable to dispose of their assets at less than market value. And uh, our, our research into this indicated that, in fact, public bodies can do this um, a, if, if various fin financial arrangements are put in place. And certainly, uh, uh, in terms of the National Forest Land Scheme, um, the, the whole issue about market value in terms of transferring public assets to communities um, is, is a major stumbling block. But again, to... to, to, to give credit to the government, they are looking at the Scottish Public Finance Manual uh, again at the moment in terms of this issue about disposal, because in the, in the, in the broader um, eco economic analysis, uh, the government could be actually saving money by transferring it at less than market value. Um, uh, but there are issues about uh, departmental budgets and agency budgets and, and, and resource accounting uh, that have to be taken in, into consideration there. So again, because of the integrated nature of some of these things, we're making suggestions about state aid regulations, we're making suggestions about the, the, um, the, the public finance manual, um, and uh, also about local authorities who have slightly different powers in terms of uh, disposal than other public agencies, uh, making it easier again for uh, public local authorities to transfer at less than, than market value, which some are doing uh, 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 currently. So th th there's a complexity there, um, uh, again, indicating how a lot of these things fit together. Um, Claudia Beamish, you want to come in on this and yeah. go on? Yeah. Right. Um, could, could I ask you, good morning to you all firstly, um, could I ask you about your recommendation 14, which relates to 
Um, if I, I, I wouldn't expect you, after all, <laughs> even after all the hard work, to remember what that is. But it does, if I can just read the part of it that I have a particular interest in at the moment. Um, the review group concludes that communities embarking on land and property ownership and management require considerable support. The group recommends that the types of support services provided in the Highlands and Islands should be made available to local communities in the rest of Scotland and that the Scottish Government, just to read the last part of the recommendation, um, should take more a, a more integrated and focused approach to encouraging and supporting the growth of local community land ownership. And I just wonder, um, in view of that recommendation, um, which I don't only have an interest in because I happen to represent a very large rural region of South Scotland, but throughout the whole of Scotland, um, I just wonder whether perhaps I might ask... Um, if that's all right with, with yourself, Dr. Elliot, if um, Pip Tubber could maybe comment on, on that um, and, and any others of the, of the group that wish to. Yeah. <clears throat> um, from my experience of 14 years in southern Scotland, uh, there is a difference um, in interest amongst communities in the south and communities in the north in buying land. Uh, to date, we've had no large community buyouts of land um, even though there's a land fund that's been offered several times to encourage communities to think about um, taking a different attitude towards land on their doorsteps. And part of the difference, I think, is because in the, in the Highlands there's been a, a long-term support structure for communities to help them think through what the land means to them and to help them think about buying the land and supporting them in doing that. And we've never had that same integrated, coordinated support for communities in southern Scotland, at least not consistently. Um, I think there are all sorts of systems in place, but they're very fragmented. Um, and we have argued for a long time in southern Scotland that we would love to see a body with a remit of high, high and high enterprise, covering southern Scotland as well, because I think that difference is, is significant. We, we've never had um, a body promoting an integrated approach to rural community development that, that we've had in the north. So this recommendation comes very much from that background. Um, I think the community land agency that's being proposed could play that role by helping people think through what the land means to them, what, it, what they could do with it. And I'm not thinking that we're talking huge scale. I suspect we're talking relatively small scale. But I still think that that um, thinking through process could bring about significant changes in community capacity and community dynamics and regeneration on the back of that. Mm -hmm. um, convener, if, if that's... Um Okay, with you, I would go on to um, talk about the um, with with the group about the agencies more broadly to support communities and oversee governance. And I see that as um, John Watt, you've already referred to um, in the evidence this morning, um, that the group recommends um, that the Scottish government could establish a community land agency within government with a range of powers, particularly in facilitating negotiation between. Um, landowners and communities, and uh, I believe if I'm correct that um, you mentioned, John, the, um, the mediation issue within um, negotiation as well, um, to promote, support and deliver a significant increase in local community land ownership in Scotland. Uh, you also um, recommend or, or consider, and I'll quote again, a need for a single body with responsibility for understanding and monitoring the system governing ownership and management of Scotland's land, recommending changes in the public interest, and that the <coughs> Scottish Government could establish um, another agency, which would be, if that's the correct word for it, um, the Scottish Land and Property Commission. Um, could, could you um, expand or, or give us some detail, um, rather than expand at this stage, on, on um, your reasoning for the establishment of the two groups? I think that would be helpful. That's not to criticise it, but mm -hmm. to, to open up this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in terms of the... Of the the Community Land Agency, we see that very much as a, a hands-on, um, on-the-ground uh, support uh, structure. Um, uh, and doing, doing, doing several things, as, as we list, uh, but the, the, the mediation role being one of the most important. Uh, that happens at the moment sort of in an informal and rather ad hoc way uh, that sometimes independent... Um, individuals or uh, bodies can actually do that mediation uh, role and and that's why many of the community acqu acquisitions to date have been done through that process and not through using the Land Reform Act. Uh, we just feel that that should be formalised a bit more so that it's less ad hoc and, and, uh, and, and uh, more consistent across the country. 
Um, and in addition to that, providing um, support to communities who want to do this in terms of capacity building and some small-scale financial support. Um, so it's very much a hands-on um, uh, uh, support network. And uh, in, in addition to that, using existing resources, we didn't think that we really needed to set up a completely new organisation uh, to do this. There, 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 there are support networks already working effectively across Scotland in different places and at different scales, and we felt that the agency, through either contractual or secondment, or could actually be using some of the existing resources, because we're very conscious about using more public money for more, more of this. Um, a, but but a, cord, a much more coordinated approach to that. So that that was really the uh, the, um, the the agency view. Um, if you want, maybe to yes, talk I think, about I the think they, they are two very different kinds of uh, animals. The the agency, as John says, is more hands on, and it would be a unit within government, um, <coughs> and it would have a day to day purpose. Uh, the 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 land and property commission would be something which is an external body appointed by government um, uh, which would have a monitoring function over the whole the way in which circumstances change and therefore the the need to keep an eye on uh, on, on land reform questions is going to change uh, just uh, in, in the nature of things and so it's a much more uh, I mean, it's not not a hands-off one, but it's a, it's a more a monitoring function. So there are two very different functions. So that's why there are two different bodies, and we hope that the <coughs> the community land agency would, because it's internal to government, uh, would be uh, less. Um, it, it would be less uh, less expensive and, and less uh, of a, of a, a, an investment in a sense than some models of community land agency that have been proposed. I mean. Uh through the convener, I, I would um, perhaps have concerns in relation to the comments that um, Pip Tab has already made about um, when you're talking about resourcing and funding, that there are strong models in some parts of Scotland um, for support and in other parts there aren't. And I would have thought that would have quite serious um, financial implications for Scottish Government um, within the relationship with, um, land, um, with the land agency and supporting communities. Do you have a comment on that? I think that would be one of the purposes of the agency to, to try to iron that out and to be able to, to use experience and expertise from one part of the country and, and ensure that other parts of the country benefited from that. Because at, at the moment, uh, in, in the administration of the Scottish Land Fund, um, uh, Highlands and Highlands Enterprise and, and the Big Lottery already provide an, a nationwide support system for those communities wishing to use the fund to acquire land. Um, and that that is already there as a as a national yeah. level uh, a service, if you like, across across Scotland. Um, I think what we see the land agency doing is is that plus and more of that, and uh, and as, as I say, equalising that the opportunities across the uh, the whole of Scotland. Thank you. And could could you expand a little bit more on the role of the um, Land and Property Commission? Um, uh, is, is perhaps, without wanting to put words in your mouth, is the reason um, for wanting it to be at arm's length from government so that it can continue whatever, you know, beyond any particular government and have a, have a monitoring role um, and keep things constantly under review? And could you comment about how that <coughs> process might uh, be taken forward? Um, I think... We haven't thought. I mean, thought particularly about how it would be taken forward. I mean, we we thought mainly about the function of it, which would be that that monitoring function. I mean, it's in the nature of of land ownership, uh, and it has been through the centuries that it gets out of kilter for a variety of reasons, and that you know you can you can keep it in check at one point, or you can you can have uh, you know in, introduce reforms, but they they don't necessarily stick for a long time. Uh, it, there, there are all kinds of different circumstances can come up which will, which will change this, the the picture and will require that kind of adjustment. And so we would expect that there should be people who have uh, particular expertise. I mean, it should be an expert group. In that sense, it's arm's length from government. I mean, in that it's a, it, it's it's more its composition than its relationship with government. I think that matters that it should be independent people who are experts in in the relevant areas and the kinds of expertise that are required will change as as the circumstances change. Um, we 
So I move on to urban renewal, I think. Next, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, uh, convener. Um, I was certainly pleased to, to see in the urban re renewal section of the report the statement that uh, bringing former vacant and derelict land back into productive use can immediately boost local confidence, uh, and I'm sure we would all welcome that. Um, the report also tells us that the annual Scottish vacant uh, and derelict land survey tells us that there were 11,114 hectares of urban vacant or derelict land in Scotland uh, in 2013, with over 40% of urban vacant or derelict land being unused for at least 21 years. Uh, and it, it goes on to say that at moderate development densities, this could site more than half a million new homes, which helps to concentrate the mind a wee bit. Um, and I was quite surprised to, to read in, in that report that there's only been a decrease of 265 hectares, or 2.3 per cent, in the total amount of derelict and urban vacant land recorded since, 20, since uh, 2007. So you, you make a number of uh, um, recommendations relating to the persistent challenge of vacant and derelict land in urban areas, uh, including exploring the feasibility of introducing a majority land assembly measure um, and also investigating the potential of introducing an urban partnership zone uh, mechanism in Scotland. Um, could you maybe elaborate uh, a bit more uh, in detail about the, the majority land assembly measure uh, and other measures on how they would bring vacant and derelict land, uh, urban land use in, into play? Yeah. Um, I, mean, I think the first point I'd make is that um, we would certainly acknowledge that the, the figure you quoted right is in terms, and I mean, I think you've got to take into account the turnover. So that the, the government's sort of policy of monitoring and investing and, and the work that local authorities are doing has been fairly successful, um, but there's a kind of underlying endemic problem um, that's not been sort of challenged and not been properly addressed. And we've tried to look at that, I suppose, in two ways. One, which is more sort of individual site specific. So, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a plot of land or whatever, or it's between two buildings, etc. And that's where we look at something like the compulsory sale order. There has been a, a, a mechanism which would encourage the recycling of land. Um, and I want to stress that because, I mean, there has been criticisms that it's a sort of status report that what we're talking about is um, transferring land from what we would regard as passive owners to active owners, whether they be private, public or community. It, it's, it's this bit about the, the importance of land recycling, really. In terms of the land assembly measures, I mean, I, I would have to acknowledge that they are two of the newer ideas within the report. And while we've looked into them and there's some international experience we can draw upon, I think they do have to, uh, they, they do require some further research and exploration, really. Um, one of our advisors, Professor David Adams, is a particular expert in this area, uh, and we drew a lot from his work and the work of some others down south uh, to try and sort of pull these areas together. Um, so, I mean, I think they are attempts to look at particularly the situation of large scale land assembly, which can be immensely challenging for particular urban communities trying to move big infrastructure projects forward. Um, having said that, as um, Alison has mentioned, cities like Dundee have done some quenching work along uh, the, the waterfront, the, the sort of former dock area, and have managed to um, assemble some land. But we do feel that there is a need to give local authorities and other developers some increased powers to try and make this a bit easier, because at the moment, from what we understand from the evidence, the major problem is that a site could involve nine, ten different landowners. You've got to find who they are, if, if you can find that out, and it's a whole sort of consensual problem. And certainly speaking to Dundee, um, th that situation where the last person is in a very strong negotiating so the last person who holds out is in a very strong negotiating position. And we looked at what happens in other countries, and they've managed to flip that a bit and change that so that. that the, the, the relationship changes and the emphasis or the kind of um, the opportunity to have a sway over that discussion switches down to a lower part of the process. So both these are kind of what we think are kind of fairly practical solutions which might address the question of the challenge of large-scale land assembly, but we do acknowledge that they do require further research and exploration. Thanks. Um, I'm glad that, that you have looked at uh, international examples. Um, You've probably heard of uh, the, the group Nordic Horizons, uh, and they've certainly highlighted um, some uh, situations with regard to majority land assembly in Helsinki and also in Reykjavik in Iceland. 
Um, have you looked at these in any detail? Um, yeah, we, we looked at this. I mean, there's quite a lot of um, actual um, evidence from a whole range of countries over a period of time, really. So we've just tried to pull together what we thought were the key ideas that might fit within the Scottish context. So I think in taking forward these ideas, um, certainly you'd want to kind of go back and draw on that international experience because it's not just in, in Scandinavia and parts of the Far East, a whole range of places this has been used, or these, these mechanisms have been used quite successfully. And, and we do think there's something that's worth further exploration. Thanks. Fine. Uh, well, we'll move on to rural land now. Uh, Alec Ferguson to lead on this. Um, thank you very much, convener. I suspect we could spend two days on this, never mind a few minutes that we have available to us. But um, it, it, it's, it's a fascinating topic, and um, the report has some very interesting and not uncontroversial proposals, I think it would be fair to say. But on, on the subject of rural land use as opposed to ownership, which we will come on to, um, one of the things the report says is that it notes that the land use strategy process will lead to, and I think I'm quoting correctly, reductions in the current flexibility in rural landowners' choices over how they use their land. And I just wondered if you could expand a little bit on the current flexibilities that exist that concern you. Um, the, I mean, the, the, the flexibilities which exist or the discretion which owners have um, is, is considerable because ownership means that you have uh, rights of how you use the land. Um, and at present, I mean, I think it's more a question of there, there being not very many constraints on how that land should be used. Uh, the, and we see the rural land, the, the land use strategy as being something which is going to be bringing, for, for example, bringing, um, uh, bringing to bear on, on land use a lot of questions about that derive from climate change and from the importance of ecosystem services uh, approach to land use. Um, and that's, that's one of the, the, the cases where uh, circumstances are changing because our knowledge of, of uh, how, what good land use is, uh, is, is becoming influenced by what we know about climate change. So it's, it's that sort of change which is likely to uh, increase the, um, which is likely to decrease the, the, the complete uh, rights or the complete um, discretion which owners have about how they use their land. We go into uh, quite a lot of examples about the, uh, quite a lot of detail about the question of how the, the, the middle uh, areas of land can be used and the kinds of dis the decisions that have to be made over that with it in connection with whether it's grouse moors or, or woodland, for example. Sorry, I'm sorry, can you just define middle areas of land for me? What, what do you mean by that? We're, we're referring to the, the squeeze middle that was defined by um, Maluri in their, in their report, James Hutton Institute. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. I'm sorry, I understand that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, apart from the, the high uplands, you know, which have one kind of use, and the, the rich agricultural land, which is quite different, it's a bit in the middle. The sort of where, where there's more, more decisions have to be made over what kind of use is going to uh, be appropriate. And considerable competition for the use of that land Indeed. as well Indeed. From, mm -hmm. from various sectors, yeah. yeah. Um, could, you, could you perhaps expand a little bit on the specific mechanisms that you're recommending to ensure that, that land is used more in the public interest as you would see it? As I understand the land use strategy, the idea is to, to encourage um, an overview of all the possible uses and all the possible benefits that you're getting from land at the moment and, and where the opportunities are to get more benefits from that land and then make that information quite widely available so that people can be, make more informed decisions about future land use. Um, and I suspect, although nobody's confirmed this as yet, that as the resources under the SRDP and other grant schemes have become tighter, it'll be more obvious to try and target those scarcer resources to, to encourage land use that's going to deliver maximum public benefits. So the land use strategy becomes a mechanism to guide land practice. I don't think it's going to be prescriptive in any way, but I think it will guide future land use so that it delivers maximum benefits to, to the people. And we think that's probably a good thing. So I mean, you're, you're effectively endorsing the land use strategy in, in this part of the report. Simple as that. We do have one recommendation is that we felt that uh, land ownership patterns are quite an important part of the land use strategy and, uh, and uh, they haven't actually been uh, included as part of the, uh, of, of the work of the pilots and we're quite strongly encouraging that to happen. Can I just move on to land ownership in that case, Kavita, because that very neatly 
leads me on to the next topic, which is indeed patterns of land ownership. And I mean, obviously, the, the one that's hit the headlines is that you are recommending a cap on the amount of ground that any individual or family interest, uh, to put it simply, can own. How, how much is enough? Um, I, I, I find that an extraordinary thing to say, to be honest, because I, I find it incredible that you, you should come out with this recommendation and not have an idea of what you mean by it. I can understand you not wanting to answer it, but I, think, I do think it's, a, it's an interesting allegation. Because is there not a difference between, and is there not a, a danger of confusing the amount of land that's owned with the influence that the owner has? I mean, if I own, if I live in a small village and I own the only single available building plot in that village... I think you could argue strongly that I have more influence over the, that community than somebody who's got 10,000 acres of moorland half a mile up the road. Um, so, so, sorry, uh, uh, mm -hmm. but is, is there not a danger of confusing the amount of land that's owned, uh, often really well managed and, and employing a lot of people and a lot of public benefit and all of these things that we all want to see, um, because there are very good examples out there as well as some poor ones. Mm -hmm. um, but is there not a danger of confusing those issues of, of, of amount of land that's owned and influence? There certainly is. Uh, there, uh, and, and we acknowledge in the report that uh, uh, the, the question of the monopoly uh, position that some landowners can be in can be over a very sh small area of land that would never, you know, that, you know we, we uh, are, are aware of areas in Scotland where uh, where one landowner has has considerable power over the the life of people in the community and um, and that is is as much a function i think as of the the social structure of that part of the country as anything else as well uh, because there in some parts the community doesn 't have anywhere to move other than to the the existing landowner so there is an issue there about a local monopoly um, the, the 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 question of the uh, putting a cap on the amount of land that can be owned uh, is something which comes out as a suggested um, answer to two questions. And I think the two questions are the ones that need to be asked. Um, uh, we are suggesting that that's an answer to the two questions. Uh, if there are other answers to these questions, okay. But, that's, but the, it's, it's, what is important is that the question be asked. Um, in terms of the relationship between the quality of ownership and the quality of relationship between the owner and the, and the local community and so on, certainly that is a question of, uh, that, that is not simply a, fun simply a function of, of size. However, the moral hazard increases the greater the amount of land someone has. And so it is, it is in terms of, and the, at the heart of, the, of that discretion is a, is, a, is a democratic question as to how much um, control some individual should have over decisions that affect a wider community. Um, uh, and, and that the more land that's involved in that, then the greater that risk. So that's, that's one of the questions. How do you handle that? How do you deal with the, the, the undoubted local monopoly that some people have and some people abuse, and not everybody does, and, and I, I acknowledge that all the time. Um, and the, the fact that the, the greater, the more land someone has, then the, the, the greater the risk that that is going to happen. The other question which the, the cap was meant to address uh, was a question of uh, investment by people who have a lot of money and who see land simply as an investment uh, without necessarily intending to do anything with it. And so it's that kind of attitude to the land ownership which we see as being um, contrary to the, the, the thrust of the report and we believe contrary to the thrust of people's views in Scotland. Um, <coughs> and again... Scotland is, is, is uh, laying itself open to abuse in that sense by people who have a lot of money. You know, you, we, we give examples of the comparison of you know, how, mu how many castles you can own in Scotland compared with a flat in Knightsbridge just now. The, there's a lot of money around and there's a lot of um, people who will be seduced by the kinds of uh, headlines from land agents saying that uh, you know, a Highland estate is the top of the Christmas wish list for the super rich. That kind of approach to land ownership is something which I think it, we, we're vulnerable to unless there is a cap on the amount of land that someone can use. But, but again, it's a question that's, that's, that's important rather than the answer. I mean, I'm, I'm, we're, we're clearly not going to agree on this. Mm -hmm. and I mean, that, that much is obvious because I, I, I just don't accept some of the premise of that argument. But I, if, if I could, 
I, I mean, I come back to this question of how much is too much because I can have a hundred acres. If, if you, I, I come back to the question of influence. I think mm -hmm. because it, 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 you, it, we're in terrible danger of taking a general brush across a, 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 an issue which you rightly highlighted mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that is a minority of cases. I, I do believe that. There's been tremendous changes in attitudes, really since the establishment of this parliament, I think, in many ways, um, of the relationship between landowners and tenants, landowners and communities, right across the country. It's gradual, but I, do, I believe it's there, and I, I think mm -hmm. you would acknowledge probably that there are some very, very good examples of, of improved relations with all of this. And I think there has been a, a, a good attempt at partnership working, which has not worked in all cases, but that I do believe, and, and I'd be interested in your views on whether or not you think this has improved, these relationships have, have improved a lot over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And what concerns me about this is that, I, you know, I think that partnership working, that working together, that persuasion and, 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 you know, gradual process, which will continue to improve these relationships, mm -hmm. is in danger of, of being... Um, not blown apart, but brought to a bit of a certainly slowed down by what is a fairly controversial and certainly mm -hmm. confrontational recommendation mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. report. And I just, I'd be interested in your comments on that. Because I think, I really think at the end of the day, despite my differences and yours, I, I think we're all after the same thing at the mm -hmm. end of the day. Yes. Yeah. Well, just if I could just add one or two comments on that. The, um, we, we became very much aware, as everybody is, that Scotland has a particularly highly concentrated land ownership pattern compared with other Western European countries and, and, and other countries further afield. Um, and, you know, that, that's, uh, that's uh, fairly well known. We were also aware that uh, there, there is probably a trend towards increasing concentration rather than decreasing concentration. Um, and we also had a remit from the government to look at potential solutions which would encourage a greater diversification of land ownership patterns in this country. So, so we, we, we came up with some ideas, and one, one of them was restricting uh, who, who can own it to companies that are based in Europe. That's one, putting a cap, and, and you, yeah, you're absolutely correct, we didn't come up with a figure or a percentage as to what that should be, but it seemed to us that it, if you wanted to, to, to tackle a completely open and free market in, in, that anybody with enough money can buy anything they like in Scotland. Um, was that the trend that we would want to see uh, in, for, for the benefit of, of resilient rural communities? And our conclusion was, no, it wasn't. Um, and these are some of the ideas we came up to try and restrict that. Can I make one final point on this, convener, if I may? Thank you. I um, appreciate that. I... I uh, I, go, I go back to a situation in sheep farming which I used to indulge myself in. In fact, I made a living at it, remarkably. Um, when we, uh, the, the sheep quotas came in uh, and you were limited the amount of shoes you could have in order to, to obtain quota, um, Scotland's biggest sheep farmer uh, gave some advice which many of us followed who were in a position, go and see your lawyers. Because people became limited companies, they became partnerships, and they found with considerable ease uh, a way around these restrictions. Um, is, this, is this not a, a, a charter for lawyers? <laughs> because I, I can't help seeing that. There is a similarity in, in that. The, the lawyers will be sitting there rubbing their hands and saying, we've got, we've got work here for years. <laughs> I had a comment along these lines from a friend <laughs> over the weekend. Um, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I, uh, I know that they have they have a capacity to find their ways around all kinds of things, and that's their job. Um, and uh, and it's the job of the government to spot that and to see ways of uh, of again improving, uh, you know, restricting loopholes if it means that they are, uh, you know, perverting the purpose of the of the introduction of the of the recommendation. We'll, we'll yeah, but I mean, I, sure. Yeah. I'm sure this discussion will continue, but thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you for your thoughts. Thank you. Some supplementaries in this, uh, particularly related to the pattern of rural land ownership, I think, starting with Graham Day. Uh, thank you. I, I'm probably much more sympathetic in principle of what you're trying to achieve here than Mr Ferguson. However, I do wonder if there's not an obvious flaw in the general concept of a one-size-fits-all cap on, on land ownership. Because if, let's say, you own 50,000 acres in the centre of Scotland on an estate, you have... The, what you talked about, the influence over so many people's lives, 
Set against owning 50,000 acres, maybe in the far north of Scotland, which is not to denigrate the far north of Scotland, but you may have far less influence. So I, I just wonder if it's too simplistic to talk about an acreage cap when different parts of Scotland, the amount of land you own would have completely different impacts. Yes, I think, that, I think that's why we would like to approach this in terms of saying that this was a proposed answer to, uh, to particular questions. Mm -hmm. And as you look at the question and you look at how, um, because, I mean, and that's another reason for, for leaving the, the, the question up to the government as to what the cap should be, because the cap will, if, if they were to go down that route, it would be one which would be geared to the answer to the question as they articulate it and as they see the, the important political question. Um, and uh, and if they choose to, I mean, whether it's a universal cap or or, or, or not, is is, the, is partly the way in which they address that question. And so we would like to see it as being, as saying that the the answer has flagged up two questions which are very important ones, and we would like to see the questions explored a bit further. That, that's useful to hear. Though. It does sound a little bit like you've let the blue touch paper and retired a safe distance. <laughs> Uh, Not Dave quite. Thompson. We've still got. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Thompson. Sorry. Yes. Please. Um, one issue we didn't get a chance to explore in full, which we would have liked to have done, was the idea of some sort of um, system that would allow us, to, or allow the government, to look at people who wanted to buy large areas of land to assess what they wanted to do with the land and determine whether they were worthy buyers of large tracts of Scotland. Now, we didn't fully explore that, but that might be another way of coming at this whole issue of a cap, because you could then have some screening process that would allow people who had the right motives and had the right business plan to acquire land, but people who you were slightly worried about or perhaps were coming in from abroad simply to invest in land as, a, as an investment, you could screen them out. So we didn't really explore that fully, but it was something we would have liked to have looked at. Them. Okay. Uh, time... Dave Thompson. Sorry. Thanks, Convener. Um, could I just uh, agree with the general principle that um, we need to curb the power and influence of uh, certain folk in the country in terms of what they own, and, and not just in relation to what they own, in other ways as well, because I think it's, it's one of the problems we have in the UK. There are a small number of people with massive power and influence and an awful lot with very little. Um, th there are issues and, and, and problems and potential dangers though in whatever system you choose to try to deal with that but that's not to say we shouldn't try to deal with mm -hmm. it we should, we must uh, I'll give you one little example of where power and influence can distort things and that's in relation to an experience that my father had in Lossiemouth uh, a good chunk of Lossiemouth was a kind of new town where the burghers of Elgin who owned it created what are really kind of small holdings uh, which gave people enough ground to grow their own and all the rest of it. But when the town council decided they needed to build more council houses, it was these very small holders that they tackled. And the reason they tackled them with compulsory purchase orders was that they were easier meat than tackling the people with the big houses overlooking the West Beach who had money who could fight them in court. So the, the small people lost their, their bits of land and the big people got off with it. So as a general principle, we need to try to rebalance, I think, the, the, the whole issue of power and influence, and that includes land ownership in Scotland. So I'm very pleased that you're going down that road, and I'm sure as we go through this that we will find a way to get that balance right. Do you have any comment to make of that? No? No, just thank you. Right, OK, we're agreeing. That's great. Claire Baker? <laughs> The points have been covered. It's just to say that I mean John Watt's comments around the trends wow. that we're seeing in Scotland, and I think we do leave ourselves vulnerable to greater concentration of land ownership. Uh, I'm not going to suggest what the cap is, but I think it's an interesting proposal to bring forward and does try to address um, how you restrict that. Was there any other um, areas that you uh, looked at if you're trying to think how do we... Because the aim of the report and the proposal from the government was to how do we increase diversification and if you have a trend that is actually working quite strongly against that how do you try and redress 
that balance. And there's also the example, one of the examples you use um, is the fairly well-known Danish um, owner of much land in Scotland who pays taxes in Denmark on that Scottish land but doesn't pay anything in Scotland to either local authorities or to UK government. I mean, those issues that you looked at as well in terms of the concentration of owner ownership. There's a difference actually between increasing diversity, which you can do in a variety of different ways, and one of the ways you can increase diversity is increasing the number of houses that are built, for example, um, and reducing the concentration of ownership. Um, and But we certainly are, are of the view that there is no single um, bullet point. That will, the single bullet that will that will reduce the concentration of ownership is something that has to be a, a track, a, a, a addressed from a variety of different ways. And John has got a, a, a very good uh, diagram here of the way in which a variety of different um, proposals and recommendations in the report we think would have a knock-on effect on a cumulative effect on that on that figure. Because you know we're talking about a half of, the, of all um, privately owned rural land in Scotland is owned by 0.008% of the population. I mean, that, as a measure of inequality, that is, that is exceptional. And it's, it's when you put it in the context of other measures of inequality, you see it's something that we can't just sit back and, and say, oh, well, that's OK. Um, we have to understand it, first of all, understand why it's there, um, and uh, see whether there are ways in which it can be addressed. We... we you're right. We did look at one or two other things, but didn't develop the ideas. We 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 looked at the possibility of owners having to be resident, um, and as Pip explained, we looked at the the, the idea of um, incoming purchasers having to pass certain tests in terms of land use and sustainability issues. Um, in other words, other different interventions in in that open land market, but we didn't develop all of these ideas, but many of, the, uh, as Alison said, there's no, sing, there's no single silver bullet for, 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 for this. There's a range of our suggestions will all have some impact, potentially, on the land ownership pattern in Scotland. And we'd be happy to give you the polite version of this, uh, <laughs> which, which uh, tends to summarise that. Um, did you look at the uh, situation in Denmark where at the beginning of the last century that they decided that nobody could own rural land to a greater extent than 250 hectares, forestry or agricultural land? In particular, we looked at the, a, a summary um, a report of the current situation um, uh, and... Uh, that, that was looking right across the EU. In that case, I mean, again, it, it comes back to the question of what question is this the answer to? Uh, and uh, a lot of the countries that did have a cap on ownership uh, size were ones in the, in the um, former Eastern, well, in, in Eastern Europe, uh, where there was a particular political question that they were trying to answer. Yeah, I just thought it would be useful to know because obviously in Ireland the government of Britain took the view that uh, it would split up the estates and that uh, the tenants would become owners on 50-year mortgages and that uh, the landlords would be thus compensated. Um, so, you know, the question was um, about concentration of ownership. And, yep. uh, you know, it's slightly different here because we're not talking about huge numbers of tenants who are starving because of the the potato famine and all the rest of it. But uh, we are talking about influences which are great. And, uh, you know, it would be helpful if we could see your diagram. And I hope that uh, we can perhaps inquire of our other panels a bit more about it, because I think this is a dialogue that we have to expand on just now. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, and Nigel Don wanted another supplementary in this. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm just wondering, Convener, I'm conscious that we must be running out of time, but I'm just conscious also that the... Uh, report includes a succession on, uh, uh, sorry, a, a section on the, the law of succession of movable property, and, and I'm, I'm not asking you to rehearse the words that are in there. I just like some feel as to how important you feel that subject is. It's extensively discussed, but I, I didn't really pick up how far this was up your agenda and how, and, and how important the people who'd spoken to you about it really thought it was. I think that there were various um, submissions on this uh, when we called for, for evidence. Uh, and generally, the, the angle that people were taking on succession law was that this was going to, cut, this was going to um, 
chop up estates and it was going to reduce the size of estates. I don't think that's actually uh, when we when we proposed the um, the abolition of the distinction between movable and immovable property. Um, it was more along the lines of this being a question of justice rather than that it was going to be a mechanism for changing the, the, the size of estates because most of the big estates are, in com are companies anyway so it doesn't apply and so on. And even, I mean, I, in speaking to, to lawyers who have had experience of, um, uh, you know, of, of dealing with cases like that, I mean, it's, if, if, um, if the, if the, if, if this is going, if it is going to be divided between the different uh, children and offspring and so on, um, then what's going to happen is that the business itself, the agricultural business, is going to be um, divided, and that doesn't necessarily mean to say that the, the, you know, one's going to get two fields and the other's going to get three fields. It's more likely that the, the business itself will go to one and the, they will buy out the other. So there are a whole lot of practicalities there in terms of the, of the practice of it. The reason we, we proposed this was that we felt that it was elevating land to a, a, a position which was very anomalous in the in the European context and it was also something which seemed to be unjust yeah. rather than it being a, a tool for changing patterns of ownership. No, I, no, I'd got that but I, I guess I would come back to the point as how vexed were people about this. I'm, I, I'm actually with you. I think it is mm -hmm. just simply unjust mm -hmm. and I'd like to change. And, and I'm sure the laws of trust and, and the ways of holding land, there are plenty of ways of doing that. Lawyers, lawyers won't even be rubbing their hands with glee because this is straightforward. You know, it's actually not a problem. A lot of it's already that way. I just, I'm just trying to get some sense of how, how vexed people were that we still hadn't managed to do this after centuries. <laughs> I mean, we did have, have um, some submissions that were, were picking up on the, the justice question. There was a woman, women's land reform group, for example, who were concerned about it from a justice question. Um, uh, as I say, most of the, the, the comments came in terms of the breaking up of the, of the property. Um, and, uh, and rather than, than saying that they had an example of where there had been uh, distress caused by this. And as you say, I think that when, when lawyers get together on this one, then there are a variety of ways of solving it. But the thing is that you know, when it comes to the bid, at, at present, uh, people can be disinherited from owning land, but not from owning other kinds of property. And that's the distinction which is problematic and the situation which is unjust. So, but it's more in terms of, uh, yeah. And appropriately, I think we'll move on to land taxation, payments and markets. And Jim Hume is going to lead on that. So. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Nothing too con controversial here, thankfully. <laughs> he, said, he said sarcastically. <laughs> uh, well, just following on quite uh, neatly from the, the last question, uh, we are always concerned, obviously, about um, new entrants, and uh, I think it's quite the view of most of us here, anyway, at least myself, that uh, the best way for a new entrant in especially agriculture is through tenancies. And, and I note that the group's intention is to retain the amount of uh, tenant farmers, but uh, al you also state that uh, changes to the current fiscal regime should include restructuring them to encourage an increase in the number of landowners in rural Scotland. That, that doesn't really balance out, because if you take away from, I suppose, estates or uh, etc. Uh, to uh, private individuals, that land doesn't come back as, a, uh, as somewhere that somewhere can start uh, cheaply enough, because nobody can just afford to uh, buy property. Uh, tenancies are the way into agriculture. How, how, how can you balance that? John? <laughs> Not my immediate area of expertise, agricultural tenancies, but the, we, uh, we 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 talk a lot, a lot about it. Um, a, I, I think that the um, we, we we were very much aware that uh, the, uh, the 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 agricultural right to buy issue was was one of the most contentious, and we we looked at that. Um, uh, in some depth. Um, I'm also aware, of course, that there's a separate uh, inquiry uh, going on uh, uh, at the moment. And again, we were, we were we, we related this to the, the actual increase in the value of land um, and, and the price of land, which uh, is, um, you know, by, by standards and comparisons to other places, actually very high in Scotland. Um, and what were what were the causes of this 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 high value? Um, which then took us into the issue about tax 
um, exemptions from a certain tax, a certain taxes, and of course the whole regime on um, a payments and, and CAP, which uh, also all influence the price of land, and a lot of these ta tax exemptions and uh, uh, payments uh, all being capitalised into the value of the land, therefore making it very difficult for, for, for new entrants. So um, it, it was a complicated uh, issue. We, we, the, the, the conclusion we came to in terms of agricultural tenancies was that it was probably not our remit to look at how this impacted on agriculture as a sector, but uh, about how um, it impacted on the social and community aspects of rural communities. And again, our, our concern looking at uh, trends of um, re reduction in the number of tenants in, in rural areas um, uh, and the amalgamation of farms was, was a, a concern for us in terms of what impact did that have socially and, and in, in terms of com community resilience. And that's really the, the, the area we focused on in terms of that. You see, you, it wasn't to focus on the remit of agriculture, but to focus on communities. But the main uh, rural land users are my area, I'm from farm and background, so I'll declare that interest, if you like, are agricultural people are working on agricultural land. So I can't see how you could have focused on changing the whole land ownership uh, and therefore tenancies without taking into account ag agriculture in that very large community. Well... You know, we were aware that, that the Agricultural Holdings Review uh, was, was going on at the same time, and um, our recommendation was that in undertaking its work, uh, which will, I'm sure, focus on uh, the agricultural sector, it should be um, cognizant and aware of the, the social and community aspects of, of changing tenancy arrangements um, uh, as well, and that's 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 the, the conclusion we came to. Just, just just to follow on to that, and I'm sure there's others want, wanting in here as well. Uh, you mentioned the, the sort of taxation uh, changes, uh, land value value taxation. And you also claim there's no uh, clear public interest in maintaining the current universal exemption of agriculture, forestry, and other land-based businesses from non-domestic rates, although they are large pairs of domestic rates, of course. Um, was there any economic impact done on what that would, how that would affect uh, the farming communities who, in Scotland? The arguments on that were, were uh, from a from a policy point of view, um, the the question of um, the 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 agricultural exemption is something which uh, is 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 questioned in a lot of uh, theoretical work on taxation. That you know, why do you exempt a whole? A whole sector from taxes rather than targeting them the, the exemptions more carefully and so there's a question coming up there there was also a question of of the the, the um, relationship of the policy of uh, protecting agriculture in that sort of way while at the same time having uh, the government having policies of in, uh, encouraging greater rural diversity um, and so there does seem to be a disconnect these days about, about exactly what vision people have of uh, the kind of rural Scotland we need. And so, so, the, so it was really to, to sort of um, uh, emphasise uh, the, the importance of, the, of, of these parts of government thinking tying together. Uh, uh, so, sorry, just on the, la on the last supplementary, mm -hmm. how, how, how does increasing taxation on one community increase diversity? Um, it, it was. It's, I'm trying to trying to think where that question comes from. Um, if you if you if you're um, reducing the tax if you're in reducing the tax burden on or the tax take um, on a particular sector, a whole sector, then that is giving favourable attention to that sector. It's also, of course, having the knock-on effect of, of that being capitalised into the land values, and so it's making it more difficult and paradoxically for people to get into, into agriculture. So that seems a strange position to have, while at the same time, uh, so it's you know, encouraging greater agriculture, while at the same time having another policy which says that you're wanting greater diversity of rural businesses. Pip, you've got more... 
Yeah, I, I mean, one of the points that was raised was it seems very unfair that an agricultural business is not paying tax on land use when neighbouring business who's also trying to run a business in a rural location is paying tax on their business. And I think the, the issue was just it's, it's a matter of, of, of trying to be f to make sure we're fair, but also make sure that we're we're encouraging the right sort of business in the right sort of place. So it, it, it's it's that sort of um, openness again, transparency. And I don't think we were saying that tax should necessarily be levied. I think we're just saying that if there are exemptions in place or if they're going to be taxed in place, they need to be thought through and set at an appropriate level. Sorry, you just raised a point about a, 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 an agricultural business and its neighbouring business not, not paying tax. I just wonder what can... This also is forestry as well, of course. What, what land-using businesses are not uh, are paying uh, non-domestic rates, whereas, whereas agriculture and forestry, they aren't at the moment, which is, you stated, that are unfair. Sorry? Shops and pubs. Sorry, I, I was, uh, I'm talking about land use, though. So we're talking about land use, shops mm -hmm. and pubs. Well, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think point is other rural businesses, not just land businesses. Mm -hmm. It was the point we're making within the report. Right, OK. Thanks. There's a area of taxation. There's a whole lot of wider ones, but it looks as though there's one or two more questions on this. But I was going to say, if you're talking about taxation and taking these things into account, presumably this is one of the things where you'd be looking for us to, to, to explore ways in which uh, the whole question of how tax on land is, is dealt with, not just the matter of exemptions, that it isn't something in isolation, that it is an overall uh, matter about land values and so on, which is going to have to be researched and, uh, and gone through. So whilst there may be concerns that somehow or other somebody's going to be penalised, it's not about penalising, it's about balancing. Am I right? Absolutely, no. It, it's important that when you make a change to the taxation system, you look at this, the impact on the whole the whole system, and 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 re and so it's a review of the whole system that is really being asked for here. Um, we have the review body on agricultural holdings, you know, coming to see us specifically. So if we can avoid going through that twice, it would be helpful. Uh, committee members at the moment, you know. Uh, Alec Ferguson's first and then Dave Thompson. Um, well, I will avoid the, the, the topics that might come up under the Agricultural uh, Holdings Review, um, but I, I, I'm just surprised, to put it fairly mildly, that you haven't looked at the impact on agriculture. I represent Galloway and, and West Humphreys. We are about to lose over £100 million pounds over the next five years out of agriculture um, and therefore out of the local economy. And this is the point I want to make, that I, I, be I believe, and I don't think anybody would argue, that a vibrant agricultural community helps to sustain a rural community, full stop. Uh, and that is certainly the case in, in my part of the world. And there is a huge concern that this amount of money coming out of a very low economy like Dumfries and Galloway is going to have a major impact on the communities of Dumfries and not just the farmers. And, and therefore, I, I, I find it uh, really worrying that there is a proposal to increase the financial, the fiscal burden on farmers, for which there may be a perfectly good case, without taking into account the apparent impact on the community as well. Uh, and and I, just, I just want to lay that on the table. Any comment you've got is fine. But uh, I, I think there is such a tie-up there between you know, community activity, community vibrancy, and, and in, in, certainly in my part of rural Scotland, uh, a vibrant um, agricultural sector uh, that I, I think to sort of look at one without considering all the implications is is not helpful. No, I think, I, well, I was hoping that, I hope that our recommendation was put in the context of a concern with the the the, 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 uh, the, the community as a whole uh, rather than the, you know, the impact on a particular part of it. And and so it, it, it as, in, as in the rest of the report, we're, we're, tr we're trying to, uh, emphasise the the wider context that these things come through in. We do recommend uh, the, the the gradual introduction um, of of uh, business rates. I think in, in in that in that sense, and we're also aware that you don't do these things overnight. 
Um, I think also, however, we, we're conscious that for a long time, one of the things I did was go back to the, um, the John McEwan lectures, which were produced in the 1990s when people were thinking about land reform in the first place. I mean, Donald Dewar at that time was saying, of course, the whole rural situation is changing and, uh, and, and, and it's becoming, you know, there's a whole variety of different rural businesses coming along. Uh, and yet there didn't seem to be much indication in the, the reading that we had other than statements that that was, that was a, a good thing, um, that it was actually being backed up by, by um, other kinds of, of policies. And so the, the wider question is, you know, what kind of rural Scotland is it that we want? And, and how can that be uh, pulled together? And so we'd welcome that being done. Right, um, Dave Thompson and then Claire Baker. Yeah, I think this whole issue of taxation raises a pretty major issue in terms of how you deal with it because the convener mentioned I think is really important and I think you're saying that as well. But the problem is the Scottish Government only has responsibility for certain aspects of taxation. The rest of that lies with the Westminster Government. And therefore, to make any real progress where if you want to change it, and I'm not suggesting anything in particular should be introduced or taken out or whatever, but if you want to change it, you have to have the ability to maybe reduce or increase at one point, but in order to keep your overall tax take and balance to reduce or intake uh, you know, uh, some, somewhere else. Um, so... When you were looking at this, I mean, how easy do you think it is going to be for the Scottish Government to introduce any meaningful, sensible change in the taxation system without having access to all the tools in the toolbox? Well, I think that one of the interesting features about it is that when you look at recurrent taxation, then most of that is in the that, that's in the in the gift of the Scottish Government. I mean, it's, these are local taxes. Um, the, the questions of uh, inheritance tax and capital gains tax, these are transactional taxes. They're the ones that only happen when, when something else happens. But the recurrent taxation system, you've got, you currently have council tax, which needs to be looked at, you know, because it's, it's, it's literally 23 years out of date. Uh, and, in, in, and need, you know, there's room for for looking at council tax again, there's room for looking at business rates again. Of course, there has been a consultation on that, but but still, that's part of the mix. And these are the recurrent taxes, and land value taxation would also be a recurrent tax. So you've got a clutch of taxes there that are all within the, the, the purview of the Scottish Government to look at. And so there is a, an opportunity for, for looking at that subgroup of taxes uh, together and coming up with a different system. So, uh, but I mean, sure, there are other taxes which are, um, which are reserved at, at present. Yeah, can I just follow up, yes. convener? Um, yeah, I mean, th that's the point. Um, there are a number of these taxes, and we can create new taxes. I dare say, or land value tax, or whatever, if we if we wish to. But if you cannot, if you don't have the other taxation powers it's going to, by definition, restrict your ability to have the real effect that you might want to have? Well, you, obviously, if you, had, uh, if you could influence the other taxes, then you would have more influence. That, uh, that, that, that follows. But as I say, the, the, the recurrent taxes are, are, are I think, a, a sufficiently defined subset that you could explore that anyway uh, with the powers that are presently uh, available mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and the other other powers are, are for you know that, that, that is something which of course the Scottish Affairs Committee is looking at uh, within Westminster and so some kind of tie-up between the two is, is something which would be worth exploring I think maybe just the final point then convener if I may that <coughs> the the fact that we we have the taxation system that we have uh, in terms of the reserved powers um, you know, we, we have what we have at the moment, and I, I think it would be extremely difficult for us to be able to influence Westminster in the way we might wish, because they will say these are their responsibilities, they have to look at the whole of the United Kingdom, and therefore if they altered one of the taxes under their remit, 
to tie in with something that we want to do in Scotland, that would have a knock-on effect on England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Therefore, they are not going to do it. So being realistic, we can only restrict ourselves to the devolved areas and therefore that, again, by definition, as I say, is going to restrict our ability to actually deal with this overall problem. Uh, do you agree with that? I would, say, I would say that there's still a lot that can be done within the devolved powers and that Ian Davidson and his team down in Westminster are a powerful force. Okay. Claire Baker? Um, thank you, Convener. Yeah, I would hope that Dave Thompson does, I'm sure he welcomes the fact that the Scottish Affairs Committee are looking at many of these areas. And I think we need to recognise that 58 out of 62 of the recommendations from the review group are under devolved um, competence. Um, when it comes to taxation, I think you're right to highlight the exemption that exists for um, land-based industries and at least raise questions about why that area continues to be exempt when you compare it to other um, rural um, businesses. But I'm sure you know, it's a reassurance to Alex Ferguson that the Minister has already ruled out this proposal, um, even though there is a when the last legislation was passed, John Swinney said there was an ongoing review and reflection on this. So it's possible that you know, there is still some discussion to be had around the continu continuation of these kind of um, exemptions. Have the committee made any kind of um, evaluation of uh, what the value of the exemptions is and how that then reflects across the wider rural business community about who is actually paying carry not the burden of taxation but who is making the tax contribution within those areas and um, what the loss of revenue what the exemption what the equivalence of that exemption is well that's the thing that came up uh, recently with the national audit office who were who were concerned to to look at what um uh, uh, to just to, to start exploring exactly what that was going to mean in terms of revenue foregone uh, and so and get a more uh, transparent account of the way in which these various taxes, payments, tax exemptions, how they all relate to each other. Um, uh, and, and they were concerned that there wasn't sufficient transparency. So I think there's likely to be movement in that direction so that it will be more clear later on. But no, we didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. We can, look, we can look to work coming from the National Audit. Yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Graham Day. I thank you. Just very briefly, convener. Um, Again, under this heading, you've talked about the recommending that the government could review the current exemptions from sporting rates and introduce a reformed rate system, as what you term appropriate in the public interest. You talk about uh, the possibility of sporting rates being tailored to each of the species involved. How deeply did you delve into this? I'm just wondering, can you actually do that legally? Is it practical to do it? Legally, um the I mean, is it, is it permissible from a tax point of view to tailor it to species? My understanding is that it isn't. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I think I think there, there are very different. Uh, I mean, one of the things that tax does, it, it, taxation does, is that it provides incentives and disincentives, and uh, um, I, and there are different ones involved. I mean, for example, you want to conserve salmon, but you you want to cull deer, so you know the, it's likely that the 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 balance of the, um, the, the the purpose of the tax is likely to be different in these cases. Uh, so I think that's as far as we got. But we certainly hadn't looked to see whether it was um, it was possible to to, to make them uh, targeted on particular kinds of no, species. Do this, yeah. but my understanding is that there may be some difficulties in that, and I just want to. Flag well, that no, one. we didn't explore that. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to profiting at the moment, um, and uh, just to first of all ask you. Um, about the crofting sump, the crofting lawyers um, are going to be making recommendations to the government about simplifying crofting law. Um, did you uh, hear the argument about um, trying to have one form of land tenure in the areas that are the crofting areas, which has been put forward by Sir Crispin Agnew and James Hunter? that you can find people with crofting law and their neighbour is in a different form of tenure um, and uh, that there's a question about whether you can, in the same piece of land use, really have two different types of laws applying. No, we didn't think about that. John, do you know much about no, this? Um, given, given the, um, the, the Shuxpeth review and the, uh, the, 
the, the, the creation of new crofting legislation in recent years. Um, we were aware that this is a big and complicated area, um, and uh, I would I would say that um, we didn't get into the guts of making more suggestions about changing crofting legislation, but we did get representations from um, crofting communities that can you make it can you make it simpler and easier, um, uh, and that's probably as far as we went, dipping our toe into that. Okay, um, in that case, we'll take that as read for the moment because it's going to be uh, leading into the next question. One of the things where there's unwarranted challenges to communities in their attempts to buy um, has been highlighted, I suppose, by the Park case in particular. Um, would you like to expand on any of uh, that, you know, about facilitating more crofting uh, rights to buy? Because on the other side of the coin is, as you know, some communities don't want to buy. They'd rather have the landlord being the, the uh, government and taking on the expenses they see of running the estate. So these two sides of crofting have both got to be addressed. Have you got any suggestions how? Well, we, we, in terms of the transfer of the government's crofting estates to communities, uh, we, 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 we did look at that in, in some depth. And we, we are aware, and looking back many years, and you'll be familiar with them, uh, convener, uh, about efforts to do this in Sky and Rassi and, uh, and, and, and in previous times. Uh, and the, there's, there's a rationale for the community just being perfectly happy with the benign landlord, which is the government. Um, uh, I think we felt that a, perhaps renewed effort and renewed proactive a, a promotion of this. Now, when the, when the Sky and Rassi uh, um, experiment was attempted uh, way back in the early 90s, um, it was it was way beyond way be, way before other community purchases. Um, I think now, with 15 years of experience of communities actually owning and running estates um, of different types, some of them with crofting tenure on them, um, uh, we felt that there's probably a, a time for a renewed proactive effort by government to try and dispose of these by making it more attractive to communities to acquire them. And, of course, it gets down to previous discussions we've had about state aid and transfer it what value um, a, in, in, ter in terms of communities acquiring. Um, and also, uh, reading back some of the, the Arkelton research on Rassi and Sky was quite interesting. Crofters being actually concerned that they would lose their rights, their individual rights as crofters, if it was owned by a crofting trust. And of course, you know, crofters would lose no rights um, in that transfer. And that, that, that level of misunderstanding, uh, I think it's, it's time for us to look again how, how that might be uh, facilitated and encouraged. And we, we are aware that there are communities who still look at the possibilities of this, and some were put off by the fact that they would have to raise huge amounts of money to, 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 to acquire these. And if there were better mechanisms for uh, easier transfer, and we know the West Harris story um, really quite vividly, uh, the struggle that the West Harris community had in acquiring land from the government, uh, uh, we would need to make that easier, and the government would have to take some proactive uh, measures to, to, to ease that process. So the government side of things we understand, but in terms of uh, what was called a hostile uh, buyout situation, um, you know, the, the unwarranted challenges, how would we remove them? Uh, would you just, uh, you know, believe that some form of compulsory uh, sale, like in derelict land or whatever, or how would you apply something that altered or simplified the part three? Our suggestions in in the report as to how that should be done, right. because the kind of the, I mean the kind of, uh, we we went up to park and in the first phase of the report, and I can still see the frustration, uh, on on the face of the person who was who was putting in the submissions, because, uh, you know the complication of of the postcode s situation that was just a, an an amazingly complicated way of doing something that could be done much more simply. Um, and the fact that it was complicated meant that there were endless appeals coming in because you know there's there's always one that you'll get get the wrong side of the burn or something like that, and and so it was it was a, a situation where it was just you know set up 
for appeals. And there's no point in having legislation which is actually not delivering what it's meant to do. So it's so there, there are suggestions there about how that can be made. So. Uh, I'm not going to expand a lot on crofting at the moment, except that I'll bring in Dave Thompson in this one because uh, there's a lot of things that we'll have to review anyway when we speak with crofting representatives, see what they say. Mm -hmm. yeah, th thank you very much, Convener. I, it was just really to comment on, on, on John Watt's um, mention of, of, of Razi and so on, the historical situation, of course, even more recently last year, the, the community in Razi turned down the option of, uh, um, you know, buying or, or getting the croft uh, from from the government and opted to stay with the government as landlord. I mean, there'll be a number of uh, reasons for that, uh, but at the same time, they were looking at purchasing off the forest, and there was a huge cost in, in relation to that, and I'm sure that would have weighed in people's minds as well. So uh, I think there, there's a lot of complex issues come into play when we start looking at these things, but I don't disagree with your general uh, recommendation that we should you know, uh, look at the, the, these estates being transferred to, to communities, but we need to make it as easy and as simple as possible. And they need to be assured, if they're going to go down that road, that they've got all of the assistance and help you know, in, in terms of how they do it and then how they uh, run things uh, thereafter. To, to follow that, um, we, we do make we make, make some suggestions as to how Part Three could be simplified, um, uh, and and to address some of the concerns you had about uh, challenges. But there there have been no successful acquisitions under Part Three uh, since the Act was brought in, and the ne the nearest we've got is in Part, which has eventually ended up, we understand, in a in a negotiated uh, agreed sale. Um, I think the, the, the community land agency would have a role in, in, in helping with this. They would be helping with uh, crofting acquisitions as well as other, other community land. Um, so support would be, would be available and hopefully with all the technical and legal uh, elements that are required in that particular type of uh, tenure. Um, I think probably what we'll do is that uh, we'll be coming back with other questions in due course and once we've looked at your report in detail we can perhaps uh, temper some of our questions to the stakeholders uh, in terms of what they think about your proposals in due course. So thank you very much for that in general. There are many more questions I'm sure that we have. One specifically about process I think would be useful at the moment. You've referred at times to research papers that you've um, uh, drawn on. Are these uh, available? Are they in the public domain? Or if we ask for particular areas, once we've seen the official report, is that sort of thing which uh, is it? Maybe, uh, you know, open to sharing them, a lot of the research papers are in the public domain. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, sure. That would be useful. I mean, I, I want to go back to my question about the witnesses because I haven't found the word confidential anywhere in the list that you provided, um, only anonymous. So is it possible to get the anonymous evidence with redaction, obviously, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if need be, um, uh, so that we could actually, if we wished, scrutinise these? Yeah, I think confidential will not be on, this, on the website, no. will it? But, but the... Well, there's a numbering sequence as one's missing. Yes. And that's, that's and from that's the confidential, confidential ones. ones. Yeah. Okay. We so, the, yeah, but the, but the ones that are anonymous, I mean, they, they will be on the website, as I understand. Right. Well, we haven't got to that stage yet yeah. of uh, interrogating the website, but thank you very much for, for those things. I mean, we noticed that, uh, you know, you come down to a definition of people-centred land governance, uh, the views of a, a Mr. Michael Taylor, a very apt set of uh, words, I think, to, to describe this. Would you like finally to sort of say, you know, given your experience over these last couple of years, do you see um, the means of achieving this people-centred land governance uh, in the next five years, the next ten years? Do you think it's something which can be achieved uh, in various work streams at various times? I think you've said already, but, you know, do you see this as a process, just like devolution itself? Um, that uh, can be achieved in a reasonable time scale with the political will to do so and the consensus. Yeah, I mean, no, I would, I would hope that that's 
where we're heading um, and the, the way in which and the speed at which we go uh, will depend on the practicalities and, and people taking on the, the challenges because there are challenges uh, in, in dealing with this. But I think in consistent with uh, attitudes in other parts of, the, uh, of, of Scottish public life, uh, we're, we're into asset-based approaches, aren't we? We're into saying that people can, if they're given the tools, uh, make a much better job sometimes of uh, being in control of their own lives and of their own communities and I think this is uh, the, the the way in which uh, these this this area is moving I would hope that as I said at the very beginning the the general position which we're taking which is saying that you know decisions about land and uh, ownership and and use should be taken in the public interest and for the common good and if we actually believe that then we can get quite far down the line of a lot of this very much for that at this stage. I think uh, it's uh, us dipping the toe and you've uh, provided us with uh, an awful lot of uh, interesting waters to uh, look, uh, to wade about in and perhaps swim eventually um, to extend the, um, the idea. Um, I think it's uh, really interesting. It's obviously one of the biggest reports we've had and we thank you for the time you've taken to explain to us just now. Uh, about it and perhaps we may well want to bring you back to explain some other things in due course if necessary so thank you for that um, I'm going to have a five minute break at the moment before we deal with the last two items which are shorter uh, on our agenda so that people can uh, have a comfort break
item two. Uh, this is an item for members to consider a Scottish Government memorandum relating to the public body's abolition of food in, from Britain order 2014 draft. This is a UK order and Scottish Parliament must give its consent to the order. I refer members to the paper and invite any comments that you may wish to have. Does anyone have any comments just now? No. There being no comments, um, in that case, I invite you to decide whether uh, you agree to recommend to the Parliament that the draft motion as set out in the public body consent memorandum is approved. It's approved. Agreed. Agreed unanimously. Thank you very much. Right, agenda item three uh, concerns the last item today uh, about the draft annual report. And uh, again, I refer members to the draft report which the clerks have provided us with. Note that the guidance is that it should not exceed 1,500 words. Uh, so any changes you may wish to propose have got to be uh, on the basis if you're putting something in, you've got to take something out. Um, and it's like the budget, exactly. So I'm wanting to get any comments about that just now. Perhaps I could kick off with one which just might want to emphasise a little more um, the role, and particularly I think it was paragraph 12, uh, the committee asked all subject committees to include an assessment of how the budget in their portfolio areas had taken account of climate change issues in their reports. If we could just add a little more about uh, saying something in relation to uh, this is an ongoing um, cross-committee uh, you know, activity which we want to encourage. Something of that sort, which would, would, would encapsulate the more detailed discussions that we've had. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Yeah, thank you, Kavina. Uh, on that specific point, um, I, I don't know what the views of the rest of the committee are, but I, I was actually disappointed by the response of some of the committees, and, and I would like to see that um, marked in, the, in, the, in that section. I don't know how many words we've got to play with, how many... Uh, out of the 1,500, we can we can add a little bit, but but I do take your point that we want to encourage committees, but I do th would like to see a marker put down about the disappointment of the response, especially as we had to go back to some committees. Do your members uh, agree that we should try to reflect that sentiment just now? We, well, in that case, we'll ask the clerks to draw up uh, words which I think you'll find congenial to most people's interest there. Uh, on that point. Yes? If, if, if I could just suggest yep. that I absolutely agree and I uh, that, that we should mark that. I think we should also highlight the fact that despite our disappointment, there, there are on, ongoing engagement with the other committees too. I think that's important because um, we will be attempting to you know, set up the process in a, uh, in a more structured fashion in future, but I'm sure that uh, we can reflect that in the, the form of words which the clerks deal with just now. Right, are there any other parts in this report you wish to raise? Claudia Beamish. Right, thank you, convener. Um, it, it was looking at the report, I, I picked up on a particular area, which is the deer management area, where under point 22, uh, when we published our letter to the Scottish Government, I'm reading this out, summarising the committee's views and setting out its recommendations on the future of deer management, we did agree as a committee that we would revisit that issue, and, and I would like again that marker put down because of um, concerns about whether the voluntary code um, is appropriate and whether we need to move to a statutory one and uh, I would like to see something about the committee revisiting this. Um, yeah, I'm sure there may be quite a lot of issues in which in this report that we'll be revisiting yeah, but in maybe, this... Well, then, take that point convener, but then maybe it's not appropriate to put down a marker in a no, particular I mean, area. It's sim in a simple phrase which, to which the committee will return or, or some sort of way to link in with the sentence that's there. I think the clerks can handle that. Are you happy with that? Folks? Uh, members? Of what's happened rather than what our, uh, what our future programme is. Sorry, Claudia. Okay. Um... Mm. It's, it's a sort of record of what the committee has done, discussed in almost a minute of the year's proceedings, isn't yes. it, in, in a way? Okay, it's, it's about reports in the previous year, uh, not about our future programme. Yeah. But, but with respect, I, mean, I, I do see Claudia Beamish's point, which may, if there was scope, and I, I appreciate there may not be in terms of the number of words we have, to perhaps highlight 
uh, in a paragraph the items which the committee has indicated it will return to at a future date. But if we don't have the scope to do it as an overarching thing, I don't think we necessarily need to. We can do it for one item. It's very difficult because of the timing and uh, also because of the uh, limitation of words. I mean, there are actually quite a lot of issues, as I hinted earlier, that we will be returning to. So if we were to list them, it would make it very difficult indeed, I think, to fit in. Um, in this case, uh, if, can, can we just sort of agree that we note, well, can we agree that we know we're going to be making a future work programme, that that is not going to be because you'll have the opportunity in public at that stage to make sure that it's on it, not that anyone wants to keep it off, uh, and that it would be easier for this report if we didn't actually mention that just now. The sentiment's there, but... As long as, convener, from... from my perspective, it was possible to note, um, if, if that's what I'm understanding that you're suggesting, um, at some point in the report, uh, the, the general point that there are um, issues that we will need to revisit um, in, in relation to whether there need to be le either legislative changes or other changes um, that we would consider. That's an awfully long sentence, but yes. Um, <laughs> What we have done over the previous year, at the moment we want to expand it to include what we're going to return to later. It becomes, I think, a different class of report. Um, and I think we start just giving ourselves work to do in the future that we honestly don't need. I, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with a moment a word of what Claude is indicating in, in terms of reality, but I don't think it's in this report. In the way that you've explained that in the, the, the course of this conversation, it's obvious to me that there's other things which are online already, including the work programme, which says that these are the kinds of things that we're going to be doing. Uh, so the report of what we've done is, on the one hand, the fact that we have the work programme and, indeed, that we decide it in public, um, you know, and then it's there for all to read, includes dear management and a watching brief, so it is going to come back up. Can we separate the two for simplicities, for logic's uh, sense of uh, the way in which Nigel Dawn has put this? Go with it. I mean, it's been useful to put... It's on the record, mm -hmm. your concerns, so that, that in itself allows us to, to note the matter when we come to the work programme in, in future. OK, we'll keep it to that simpler matter of the, the report card. Are there any other points that need to be raised on the... Um, something I thought about, I don't know whether we... Did, we didn't mention in paragraph 25 on behaviour change. It struck me as something we sh we've mentioned that at above 23. Um, there's a list of other evidence sessions. OK, so behaviour change is covered. Great, got that. Anything else? If not, um, we have, first of all, to sign off the report. Do we agree that uh, I, as the convener, should finally sign this off with the uh, small changes that we've agreed? Agreed. We're agreed. And the annual report will be published next week, like all other annual reports from the committees. Well, thank you very much. The details of our next meeting, before I close, that uh, on the 4th of June, the committee will take evidence from a roundtable of stakeholders on the Land Reform Review Group final report at a later starting time of 11 a.m. So that's for your note, and uh, thank you very much. We'll close the meeting now and go into private.